a new day or a false dawn? Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. You take a look at where we stand with about uh, two hours to go. Very small gains. You're looking at an S&P 500 up about two-tenths of a percent. You take a look at big tech up about one-tenth of a percent, shaping up to be a quiet end to a busy week. Meanwhile, you take a look at the bond market. It's pretty much unchanged as well, but that follows an epic rally. You take a look at where the 10-year is trading right now, 4.42%. Of course, we were above 5% not too long ago. And I wanted to talk about crude as well because an amazing reversal that you've seen there. We're actually rising a little bit today, up 4%. Uh, had been heading to what was a fourth straight week of losses, Romain. Yeah, fourth straight week of losses here. But you try to look at some of the positive sides that we've seen this week here. And it has been a big week for several sectors in the equity space. A big week for retail and apparel stocks. That's on the back of some encouraging earnings reports as well as that official government data we got a few days ago that investors interpreted as signs of consumer resiliency. William Sonova having its best week going back to May of 2022. Macy's having its best week since 2020 and Target posting its strongest week since 2019. Next week brings results from other high profile retailers. That includes Nordstrom, Kohl's, Best Buy, Urban Outfitters as well as Abercrombie and Fitch. It's also been a big week for financial stocks as well, driven by big moves downward in benchmark treasury yields. That drop in borrowing costs intertwined with an easing and concern that the Fed will push the economy, won't push the economy into recession, I should say. That drop in borrowing costs also pointing to lower deposit expenses further down the road. RBC Capital Analyst Gerard Cassidy writing in a note on Wednesday that historically reaching the terminal rate for the Fed funds has been a catalyst for bank stocks to start outperforming the market. Those bank stocks heard that message. J.P. Morgan this Friday sitting on a third straight week of gains. Wells Fargo rallying back above its 200-day moving average. And regional lenders, including Bank United, having their best week since 2020. But not everyone out there is popping the Prosecco this week. Bank of America strategist Michael Hartnett instead pouring a bit of cold water on the market enthusiasm out there, looking the equity rally in the mouth and saying investors, Katie, should offload risky assets as a lot of the technical and macroeconomic indicators, in his view, are still pointing to the downside. And one of the technical factors that he's looking at, Bank of America has a number of different indicators, and this one is saying that now that the S&P 500 is at 4,500, it's time to fade what Michael Hartnett says is an epic rally. And you think about the journey that we've taken, of course, uh, at the end of last month, getting close to 4,100, just kissing that now, all the way back to 4,500. Bank of America is basically saying too far, too fast, Fade this. You take a look at where investors are heading to. It seems like uh, the bid for cash is still alive as, and well, even with this epic rally. You take a look at what is sitting in money market funds right now, hitting another record high of $5.7 trillion, Romaine. And what's remarkable, you take a look at this chart, particularly starting in 2022, even as stocks soar and fall and soar again, that bid for cash just continues on. Let's get some insights out of our first guest as we kick you off to the close here on this Friday afternoon. Brian Levitt joining us right now, global market strategist over at Invesco. And Brian, let's start off here with some of the moves that we've been seeing uh, in risk assets and for that matter, riskless assets as well. There's a lot of, I guess, pontificating about how much further these rallies have to go. And I guess that depends a big part on where you actually think we are in this cycle to begin with. Where do you see us right now? Yeah, it, it felt pretty late cycle, but in actuality, this economy has been resilient and the Federal Reserve is, is yeah, well, at least for now, seeming like they're, they're reasonably sticking a landing in terms of the inflation rate having come down significantly and the unemployment rate still staying low. Now, that might not persist indefinitely, but in our opinion, that's, that's opened up an opportunity for risk assets here, and it's why you're seeing cyclicals outperform defensive, small over large, value over growth, uh, very much what you would expect in a risk on environment. And we expect it to continue through the end of the year into the beginning of next year. Some of the outperformance that we've seen uh, in cyclicals and the Russell and as well as S&P 400 mid caps here, is, is this also a bit of a valuation play as well? The idea that Microsoft and the other big cap tech stocks have run so far so fast that now you kind of have to go down a step to find true value? 
Well, I'm not so sure that value is a timing tool. I mean, we saw growth stocks that were quite elevated for a decade compared to value stocks from 09 through 2019. So just because something's cheap doesn't mean it doesn't stay cheap. You need a catalyst. And what that catalyst is, is a more resilient economy and inflation that has come down quickly. I mean, Americans report not feeling good about the economy, but the reality is the misery index, unemployment plus inflation, is down at 7.1 percent. That's well below the historical average and very much in line with what cyclical assets would want to see. This environment where inflation's come down, the economy's still chugging along, I mean, that's, that's a good backdrop for value and cyclicals. I want to talk, though, about cash, because really the march into cash has been one of the most remarkable market events to watch over the past year, the past two years. We're sitting at $5.7 trillion in money market funds right now. What is the read there? It feels like, obviously, we've evolved far beyond cash just being a safe haven asset. But where are these new continued funds coming from? Well, some of it's coming from bank deposits. So investors wake up and say, you know, I'm getting not as much here. I might as well go to money markets. Other parts of it, as we all know, is just a risk off trade for investors. They're concerned about things that may happen in the future. Usually investors don't time these things well. By the time you get to pretty elevated money market rates, it suggests that, uh, uh, the markets are likely to climb, and, and that's where we've been, markets climbing the wall of worry that investors have been so worried about. But what I think is what is really interesting is the move you've seen in short and longer rates recently. Uh, you know, for a lot of investors, we've been saying, look, don't just enjoy these rates for 30 days. You have reinvestment risk. Go further out. Uh, lock them in. Actually, I was just talking to my father and father-in-law about this in the early 1980s. And what they were saying is, and we talked about this, it's you could have gotten 18 in CDR money markets or 16 going out further Everybody liked 18, and you would have been a lot smarter going further out. So it's good news that the investor is not euphoric, although I would like to see them start locking in some of these yields that are presenting themselves to them. I feel like there's some sort of indicator in there. I'm going to try to work on a name when you talk to both your dad and your father-in-law about that. But when it comes to the bond market, obviously, we've seen some amazing moves, a lot of volatility, first up in yield and now down in yield. Where do you think fair value is when you're thinking about the long end of the Treasury curve? If you look out long term, you want to think about what the nominal growth potential of this country is. And you know, the 10 year inflation expectations around two and a quarter, real GDP expectations projected around two. So, you know, let's figure a low 4% rate, which means the Fed has some work to do in order to normalize the yield curve. Now, don't get me wrong, we'll have patches of weakness in the next decade where rates are in the threes and, and perhaps bounce up above the low fours at different points. But nonetheless, it's not an environment that should favor a 5%. Treasury yield or anything above it, you would have to envision a significant pickup in inflation or a significant pickup in real economic activity, neither of which make particular sense to me at this stage of where we are in the business cycle. Then this gets us back to the whole data dependency of the Fed and for that matter, the market here. And when you start to piece together those data points here, does it give you at least a bit more confidence that what's being priced in now is appropriate? Yeah, it, it gives me confidence that what being is priced in now is appropriate. The Fed, the Fed is done, and they they should be done. Um, again, the economy is is going to show some signs of weakness. Doesn't mean it's it's crashing into a recession. Um, shows some good signs of, of of growth, but but will moderate a little bit. And inflation. I mean, wh we've seen the super core uh, PCE come way down. We've seen the headline inflation number down in the low threes. The inflation expectations are very well contained uh, for the tips break even. So I think the Fed has done their job. And I think if anything, the next move from the Fed could be to start to ease policy as we move through 2024 in order to try and, and navigate, uh, manage this environment uh, that will likely see a growth slowdown as we move out in 2024. All right, Brian, always great to talk to you. Brian Levitt there, global market strategist over at Invesco, helping kick things off to the close here on this Friday afternoon as we turn our attention back to geopolitics with President Joe Biden closing out the APEX summit after three days of huddling with world leaders in San Francisco, most notably the leader of the second largest economy, Xi Jinping. What's the path forward for the two superpowers? That conversation coming up.
Plus, we'll talk to the CEO of online grocer Misfits Market about whether the sector is still bearing fruit against the backdrop of persistent inflation. And all the talk, of course, is about Novo Nordisk, Eli Lilly, and their weight loss uh, shots. But now we're touting pills, oral versions of their blockbuster weight loss drugs, but some of the details about their efficacy and side effects might actually surprise you. That conversation and so much more coming up in a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. a new slate of Fed speak out today. We're talking Daly, Collins, and Barr all out with comments. Bloomberg U.S. economy reporter Steve Matthew joins us now to break it all down. And probably my favorite comment that came out of the parade of Fed speak was from Mary Daly saying that it's easier to communicate with the public than it is with markets. We know that the markets have been eager to price in rate cuts next year. What have the Fed members actually been saying about that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and on Wall Street and even among Bloomberg columnists like Connor Sen, uh, there everyone is talking about uh, rate cuts. The Fed is not there. The Fed is like doing everything they can to say we are not at mission accomplished. Uh, you heard Michael Barr, the vice chair for supervision today, say uh, to the Odd Lots uh, uh, crew that uh, you know, we are at or near a peak in terms of rates. But, but the wording there is, is really critical. What they're saying is that they may have to go a little bit higher. They may not have to go higher, but they want to keep the option open to go higher. And they're not even thinking about rate cuts right now. And, and that's, yeah. I, I, I spent, you know, six days, over six days, I was in like five or six different states and uh, with uh, a bunch of Fed spe speakers. And they all said the same thing. Nobody is thinking about cuts. Everybody is leaving the options open for more hikes if necessary. This gets to the idea, though, too. I mean, kind of what the market, I mean, I know some of what the market is pricing in is just their own wishful thinking here. But when you look at the data, uh, Steve, and when you listen to the commentary that we've gotten out of these Fed officials, where is this daylight, if at all, this daylight that the market seems to be finding for rate cuts? <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the inflation news this week was unquestionably really, really good news, uh, but it's only a month. And as uh, Chair Powell said at the last press conference, you know, the path to disinflation and to the 2% uh, target for, for inflation is going to be bumpy. You know, it's going to take some time. So the fact that we have one good month doesn't mean the next month is going to be good. And it's like if the next month is surprisingly bad, people may have to reprice their uh, their view on the Fed rate path. So there may be a little bit of uh, over enthusiasm about one good month of, of inflation. And Steve, there was a great story out about how, given this fraught environment that really uh, has prevailed throughout the Fed chair's reign, Jerome Powell's reign, he's suffered remarkably few dissents, especially when you take a look at uh, what some of his predecessors saw. When you think about just how tense it's been, first the pandemic, uh, just the hottest inflation that we've seen in generations, how surprising is it that we really haven't seen Fed members break rank with the Fed chair? Yeah, it's really interesting story. And one of the things that is remarkable about it is Chair Powell has really strong political skills. So you see that when he deals with Congress, but you see that when he deals with the committee as well. He calls each of the committee members, all of the 12 Fed presidents, and, all, and, and meets with all the governors in person before each meeting. And he builds that consensus. And he makes sure the language is going to get approval from everyone. So some of that is his, his internal politics. There's also a sense that right now the economy is cooperating. You're seeing disinflation. The inflation rate was 9%. It's now, you know, in the threes. Uh, yeah. And so inflation is coming down and unemployment is below 4%. So you're getting a good labor market. Inflation's coming down. That is not requiring hard choices where you have to choose one or the other. And that, that will make it more difficult if that happens. All right, Steve Matthews, our man uh, down south there in Atlanta, keep an eye on, I guess, all the wishful thinking right now in the swaps market and, I guess, uh, data and, more importantly, Fed speak that doesn't seem to support it.
All right, we're going to pivot back to geopolitics right now as we await the start of, uh, of uh, an event there with all of the APEC leaders. Of course, this is coming on uh, the final day here of the big APEC summit taking place out there in San Francisco. Of course, we're waiting to hear from Joe Biden, uh, of course, leading this summit here uh, in the U.S. and the handoff to his counterparts here who will take the APEC summit forward in the years to come. Anne-Marie Hordern is still out there in San Francisco joining us right now from our Bloomberg Bureau. And Anne-Marie, uh, give us a sense here as to whether uh, the summit that we had this year really produced anything, I guess, anything commensurate with what these leaders came into hoping to have. Well, I think two things, and we'll hear from President Biden as he passes the torch on to Peru. This is the first time in 12 years that the U.S. has actually hosted it. And I think what has been very obvious throughout this entire summit is the other summit that took place, and that's between Biden and Xi Jinping. And really all the attention and coverage, even when you speak to other leaders, that's what they were focused on. Where does this, where is this relationship going and what did that meeting produce? I would say that with that meeting came not so much a warmer of ties, but the fact that ties potentially won't get any worse. So they are trying to put a floor under this relationship, especially for the Biden administration as we go into an election year. And I'd say for Xi Jinping, the real win here was less so meeting of world leaders, but meeting America's most important chief executive officers. Um, he had this standing ovation at an event where he gave a very warm speech. The New York Times was talking about uh, an interview they had with one of the founders uh, 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 that put that event together that said the Chinese had prepared three speeches for that CEO speech and event. And after the Biden-Xi meeting, Biden, uh, Xi Jinping went with the friendliest of speeches he could have given. And then he had another address that we have the transcript for, he didn't actually give the speech, where he talks about heartwarming welcome of the business community. So right now it's a lot of soft, warm words, but let's see, Romaine and Katie, if that turns into action. I like that phrase, soft, warm words. It sounds very comforting. And of course, there were deals struck on AI, military communications, fentanyl, et cetera. But leaving this meeting, I mean, where is still the most distance between these two major power economies? That, that's right. There was a number of deals on the fringes. Again, I think a lot of that we need to see the proof in some of those deliverables, especially when it comes to fentanyl. Is China really going to go after some of those chemical producers, the military to military cooperation? That received a huge applause. And I was there at the speech President Biden gave yesterday to CEOs at the APAC CEO summit. But, Katie, when it comes to what's left, you have to imagine Xi Jinping really was pushing in this meeting for tariffs to be released for export controls to be rolled back. The United States is not going to touch any of those economic penalties if they infringe on U.S. national security. So I think a lot of this relationship right now is about taking the heat out of it. But as we get ever closer to the election next November, that rhetoric is start, going to start to get hot again coming out of the United States. All right, Anne-Marie, really appreciate your time and your reporting this week. That is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. Now coming up, much more ahead, this is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. You're looking right now at the uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, there sitting down there at the APEC leaders retreat. The president, Joe Biden, here in the U.S. is hosting this, of course, taking place alongside the official Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum in San Francisco, which has been playing out uh, all week long here. Of course, the big meeting just a couple of days ago between those two men, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, the handshake uh, that a lot of people anticipated would lead to some sort of fruitful progress in uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China. And at least so far, there does appear to be some progress made on that front. We're going to keep an eye on this and, of course, bring you any sort of details and news that we get as soon as they arrive. We do want to pivot, though, to the oil market here, which is headed for what is now going to be a fourth straight weekly loss. This after sinking into a bear market, a development that actually poses a bit of a headache for OPEC plus leaders who are set to review their production targets later this month. Bloomberg Managing Editor for Energy and Commodities, Simon Casey, joins us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And the pullback that we saw in crude oil uh, was pretty interesting. And I'm wondering sort of what's driving it, because it gets to this idea of what these OPEC leaders are really going to have to address. Are they going to have to address the supply side, or is, do they need to be much more concerned about demand? I mean, OPEC can't do much about demands. 
they've got right to be worried about demand. Um, here in the US, we've, you're seeing sort of macro signs, you're seeing unemployment data suggesting maybe we're at a sort of peak for demand. It's really unclear what's happening in China. I mean, the real estate situation doesn't completely bleed over into what we're seeing in terms of gasoline demand, but again, it's looking a bit soft. Refinery orders were down in October. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, jet fuel demand is picking up, so it's very mixed. Um, on, the de on the supply side, well, we know OPEC cut production earlier this year by a million barrels per day. Um, the speculation has been, even going back a couple of weeks or so, before this meeting that's coming up the weekend after next, they're probably going to extend that out into the end of next year. And they've already said they're going to, sorry, to the end of this year. Right. They've already said that. But could they extend it beyond that? I think increasingly people are seeing that. I, I saw an, a survey earlier today from Bloomberg Economics, and, and the, the expectation was yeah. that that is going to happen. Well, let's talk about this divergence of outlooks when it comes to the supply side, because you have the EA, the E I E A. That's a lot of letters on one hand, and then you have OPEC yeah. plus, and it seems like there's some distance between them. Very much so. I mean, I E A historically has represented the consuming nations, so there's a, maybe a maybe a bias there. Uh, they are projecting uh, a, de a deficit of uh, a million barrels a day on average next year, so that means demand is exceeding production. Therefore, inventories will fill that gap. OPEC is much more bullish. I think if memory serves, they're talking about 3 million barrels next year. I mean, both of those things cannot be right. Um, but OPEC is being very bullish. They, uh, the Saudi oil minister earlier this week was blaming speculators, not for the first time, uh, hedge funds, speculators in the financial markets for driving the oil price down. Yeah. All right, uh, Simon Casey, who helps lead our uh, energy coverage uh, here at Bloomberg, a closer look here at the ructions that we've been seeing in the commodity space. Meanwhile, let's go back out to San Francisco here. We are waiting to uh, the latest retreat here uh, of the APEC leaders uh, now seated at the table there. Joe Biden, the president of the United States, leading this year's summit here. He will actually pass the baton uh, to uh, the leader of Peru, who will take over uh, for the next big summit here. But I think, Katie, we talk about sort of what the expectations were going into this. I don't think anybody was paying attention to the other uh, countries in this. This was all about uh, the U.S. and China. Yeah, that's the thing. I was uh, trying to read up on some of the other happenings. But obviously, the focus is uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. And as Marine Hor Anne Marie Hordorn said to us, a lot of soft, warm words in mm. terms of actual deliverables. There's still a lot of gulf there. And we should point out, too, I mean, we kind of joke about no one really caring about these other names, but there was some great Bloomberg reporting about how all of these other countries have really put a lot of pressure on both the U.S. and China to actually get back to the table, to normalize relations to some degree here, because, of course, this affects them, too, as well. They're dependent not only on China, but they're dependent on a big way on the U.S. as well. Stick with us. A lot more coverage coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close here on a Friday afternoon with a good week for uh, U.S. equities, a relatively good week for Treasuries as well, at least on a price basis, but of a bit of a mixed bag going on right now in the commodity space. Abigail Doolittle, she's standing by right now to explain with our commodities close. Abigail. Mixed bag indeed, Romaine. For the Bloomberg Commodity Index overall, basically flat down slightly. But take a look at these big moves beneath the surface, especially uh, WTI crude up 4.1 percent. Goldman Sachs is out saying that they believe that uh, OPEC next week uh, will move to support prices uh, after the big fall from above $90 per barrel. So traders are trading oil higher on the day. Natural gas, on the other hand, down once again, down 3.3 percent. Uh, some investors, traders are worried about excess supply. Corn down 1.5 percent, really a piece of this year's 31 percent decline, the worst year since 2013. It's not really clear why this decline is in place. In fact, there's some uh, information out there about weather in Brazil that would support the idea of tightness in supply. And then cocoa uh, up 1.6 percent at its highest level since 1978, very close to that all-time high. Uh, there are supply fears on yeah. robust European demand and uncertainty remain. Our thanks there to Abigail Doolittle. Let's go back out to San Francisco where President Joe Biden is speaking now with APEC leaders. Side 13 of our APEC partners were also made historic progress yesterday when the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework with the first of its kind agreements to strengthen supply chains accelerate our clean energy transition, and combat corruption. As we begin our discussions today, I want to highlight a few areas that I believe we can do even more, in my view. First, inclusive growth. 
When everyone in our economies has a chance to contribute, everyone gets a fair shot. We're all, we all do better. So today, I'm proud to announce that we've launched the Women in the Sustainable Economy Initiative. Partners, uh, partners in this initiative have already pledged more than $900 million, $900 million to increase women participation in blue and green industries like forest management, clean energy, fisheries, and recycling. And if you wonder why I'm so enthusiastic about this, I got more women in my cabinet than men, so I've got to get this straight. But all kidding aside, I think this is a very important initiative, including by creating the first ever facility dedicated to helping women and women-led businesses and organizations in developing countries uh, to gain access to climate finance. We're also supporting programs that expand access to STEM education to address laws that limit women's equal access to land and natural resources. And we plan to invest in young women entrepreneurs in the maritime sector and to scale up these projects as well. I challenge us all to find new ways we can seize the full potential. And we're listening right now to President Joe Biden speaking here uh, at the Secondly, APEC summit leaders retreat here, along with his counterparts uh, from the major uh, uh, Asian uh, economies there, uh, talking a little bit about some of the progress that was made this week at that summit. You can hear those comments in full on live go on your Bloomberg terminal. And of course, if he says anything that is uh, material to you and the markets, we will bring it to you as soon as we get it. We do want to pivot now and go back to the markets and the private markets and M&A. We've been seeing a lot of it in the grocery space, whether it's Wonder's recent deal for Blue Apron or Kroger and Albertson still seeking federal approval to merge. Misfits Market, it's an online grocer specializing in unwanted organics, unusual meat cuts and overstock pantry favorites. It recently completed its own acquisition, a company called Imperfect Foods. The CEO, Abi Ramesh, joins us right now to talk a little bit more about what's going on in this space and some of the consolidation. Abi, great to have you here on the program. And let's just start off. I mean, for those folks who aren't familiar uh, with Misfits, you're kind of taking food that to a certain degree would otherwise be thrown out or certainly not used in any sort of prime way and finding a better way to repurpose that for folks who are looking to buy their online groceries, right? That's exactly yeah. right. And, and if you know, the, the food waste statistics in the U.S. are staggering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, roughly a third of what we produce at the farm level doesn't actually make it to the consumer. Uh, and so at Misfits Market, our mission is to take all that food that would have gone to waste, mm -hmm. uh, bring it into our fulfillment centers, and sell it to households at a discount. And so we serve two important value propositions. One is the sustainability value prop. We're rescuing food that otherwise would have gone to waste. And two, we're actually providing a more affordable option for grocery delivery compared to a lot of the other options out there. So we're tackling affordability and sustainability. Uh, I mean, you founded this business, I don't know what, but like five years or so ago here. We mentioned in the intro uh, the acquisition of Imperfect. And I'm curious as to why you felt you needed to do that. Um, well, a couple of reasons. One is online grocery, the name of the game is scale. Mm. And, uh, you know, when we kind of talk about what's going on in the space right now with an M&A in general, it's because companies are realizing you know, there's a lot of fixed assets, a lot of fixed overhead, and if you can get scale through inorganic methods like M&A, uh, that accelerates your path to profitability and, and helps the business. Um, so, so that was one big part of it for us. The other piece of it was both Imperfect and Misfits were tackling the same mission. So we were frenemies for a long time. Imperfect was sort of the, our West Coast counterpart and Misfits started on the East Coast in Philadelphia. So we looked at it and said, hey, we are tackling the same end goal. We have the same mission and vision. Um, why should we continue to compete for customers, uh, compete on advertising dollars? Doesn't it make more sense to put these two businesses together? So we, we started that journey a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we just completed our acquisition. We merged operations, logistics, um, team, customer bases, and everything. And now we're one unified platform. Uh, we're double the scale that we were before mm -hmm. the acquisition. So it's had a meaningful impact on our economics. Let's talk about the competitive landscape a little bit. Uh, just two days ago, there was an article in the FT about too good to go. It's Europe-based, but as the article lays out, it has its sights set on entering the U.S. market as well. And I know that you just completed that acquisition, but do you see more M&A in your future as some of these uh, other players enter the U.S. market? Yeah, so if you, know, if you asked me that question a year and a half ago, I would have said probably not. Um, but looking at the market now, I, I definitely think there is more ahead um, and we're 
right? We're, we're eyes wide open looking at all the opportunities that have presented themselves. Um, and and you, you mentioned Too Good To Go, but there have been, you know, I, you guys covered the Blue Apron Wonder acquisition uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, Gatier announced their acquisition of uh, Fresh Direct, which is you know, largest grocery, online grocery store in New York. Um, there's a lot of consolidation happening in the space as companies decide either they're going to be acquirers and get scaled that way, or there's companies that decide that uh, they need to be acquired and that's their only path to, uh, to, to sort of you know, profitability and standalone. So yeah. th there's a lot more to come and we're looking at it actively. I'll hold that thought for one second in conversation right now with Avi Ramesh, the CEO of Misfits Market. Of course, another big story, though, that we have been keeping an eye on here is uh, some controversial posts made by Elon Musk, of course, the head of SpaceX, the head of Tesla and the head of X, a company formerly known as Twitter. Several advertisers saying they are now pulling or suspending their ads from X, and that now includes Apple. We learned from several other big uh, major companies, including retail focused companies, that they have either suspended or completely disbanded their advertising advertising on that platform. This largely uh, is tied uh, to a post uh, that Elon Musk made in response to another post that was widely interpreted as being anti-Semitic. We'll get you some more details on what's going on with that in just a bit, but we do want to get back to our conversation, Katie, with the CEO of Misfits Market. And you mentioned, of course, that you see more consolidation in this industry going forward. I want to talk about IPO prospects as well. Of course, we saw Instacart uh, take the stage, come out of the pipeline just a couple of months ago. Is that something that could potentially be in your offing as well? Um, it's, it's something we talk about quarterly, and it's something that um, you know, might be on the horizon. We're, we're willing to be patient is a short answer. We don't have any pressure to go take the business public tomorrow. I think we're keeping an eye out on the market. And I think there are, there are mixed sentiments right now about what the IPO market looks like, especially for online grocery. Um, so for us, I think we have a, a path to continue to stay private, uh, grow the business organically, and look at additional, uh, uh, additional M&A opportunities. But um, if the IPO market presents itself as an interesting opportunity, we're, we'll be looking actively. Well, Avi, keep us updated. It's great to talk to you Thank today, you. though. That is Avi Ramesh. He is the CEO of Misfits Market. Now, still ahead, Best Buy expected to report next week. We'll preview what the company may say about back-to-school sales and the upcoming holiday shopping rush. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off here with analog devices, upgraded to overweight over at Morgan Stanley. The analyst there, Joseph Moore, says the downturn in chip demand isn't over and may not reach a trough until the second quarter of 2024. But believe it or not, that could be a good thing for analog devices, which he says has outperformed its peers in previous down cycles. And the company has already guided investor expectations lower, those shares higher on the day by 2%. Next up, let's take a look at ChargePoint. More analysts throwing in the towel on the maker of charging stations following the sudden replacement of the company's longtime CEO and the posting of disappointing quarterly revenue. Oppenheimer among the sell side shops downgrading, cutting its recommendation to perform and says it wouldn't be surprised by deeper cuts into operating expenses. Shares having their worst day on record down more than 30 percent. And finally, let's take a look at Decker's Outdoor. Truist starting coverage of footwear and apparel stocks and giving Decker's a solid buy rating and a $735 price target. The analysts cite brand heat for the company's Ugg boots and a Hoka running shoe that it says is in the early innings of a robust growth story. The shares having a relatively robust day up about 1%. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to say in the sell side space and stick with retail as well because we're going to get more retail earnings next week. Best Buy expected to report on Tuesday and investors are hoping for improvements to same store sales despite consumers cutting back. For more on what to expect, let's turn to Greg Milish. He's senior managing director over at Evercore ISI. And he's got a, a inline rating on Best Buy. All right, Greg, let's start off here. I mean, I was looking at Best, Best Buy's having a phenomenal week, by the way. And we should point out the backdrop of heading into the holiday uh, holiday shopping season and the big Black Friday events uh, coming up here in about a week's time here. How much is Best Buy going to be dependent on this season? Well, look, it's a critical quarter. Uh, it's a critical month for Best Buy. Uh, and, the, and the real trend that we're watching for is uh, we do think sales got less negative this quarter. And hopefully uh, that has continued into uh, Black Friday weekend. 
Uh, consumers are focused on value, so uh, Best Buys certainly lean into a lot of that and some particularly strong offers. Uh, but frankly, uh, electronics generally and big ticket consumer discretionary products, it's tough out there and the, most of the categories are still falling yeah. uh, year on year. So we think it's going to be hard for them to get back to a positive comp this year. Well, that's what I'm curious about, too. And this isn't just my question isn't just specific to Best Buy. But overall, when you look at a lot of the hardline retailers, there is this idea that there really was kind of a massive pull forward. Obviously, we bought a lot of stuff in 2020 and 2021, but the pandemic. But even when you look at some of the spending levels heading into late 2022 and into 2023, I feel like we all have our computers and our refrigerators and all the things uh, that we would want. And there isn't really a much of an appetite to re-up. Uh, you, know, you, you make a great point. And we, and we just cut our forecast for next year for retail sales growth to be 2% uh, down from 3% this year. Uh, and the reason is it's just, it's slowing. It's not collapsing. It's just, we bought a lot of stuff with all the checks that were sent out during COVID and then after COVID in 21. And for durable goods, especially now with interest rates up, uh, it's just people don't necessarily need the products. That's why we're focused on areas where uh, we don't see deflation, things like auto parts uh, that are more need based. We think those are the kind of areas where most of our top five names, uh, our top five portfolios, need based retailers that are growing traffic. Uh, and, and Best Buy, unfortunately, isn't one of them. Well, Greg, I was going to say, when we think about what we've heard from the retailers so far, especially over this past week, there seems to be a trend of profitability is improving, but when it comes to same store sales, it's just been a wave of disappointment. What are you expecting out of Best Buy when it comes to comp sales? We think their comps uh, for the third quarter that just ended in, in October will be negative six. Uh, that's a little better. I think about 50 bips better than the second quarter. And we do think they'll be less negative further in the fourth quarter. Uh, but I think you know, if you go back on it on a very uh, long uh, time horizon, uh, you know, the, the point is that whole category and Best Buy in particular, you know, if you look back to sales growth from 2019, it's de minimis, uh, whereas for overall retail sales were up 30 percent. So I think the, it, Best Buy is doing well in their category, but it's a tough, tough category. Uh, one other thing I think we're going to watch in this is to see that how strong is the consumer mm. and uh, Best Buy makes about a third of their EBIT from the profit share of their credit card operations. So that's one thing sort of under the hood next week when they report, just learning to see, are there any cracks in that? Or are we starting to see some more write-offs in their uh, consumer credit book? And Greg, as Romaine mentioned in the intro, you have an inline rating on Best Buy. When we get those numbers, is there anything that you could see that would bump you up to a buy on the heels of it? Uh, well, we always you know, take the data as it comes in and see what's there. I, I think what's, what's good about Best Buy as a business is that they might be in a tough neighborhood, uh, but I think they are managing it well. They're holding a growing share. Uh, so what they can do in terms of uh, win relative share in customers and keep those customers loyal, I mean, that's always makes me feel better about any company. The, the, as long as the credit profits don't start coming in, uh, you know, the the dividend should be secured a 5% yield, which isn't too bad. So, I mean, there are attributes to Best Buy for sure. It just certainly doesn't, it doesn't reach, you know, we don't have a buy on it and uh, it doesn't reach the top of our list. All right, Greg, uh, great to catch up with you. Greg Millish there over at Evercore ISI, a closer look at Best Buy and some of the retailers heading into a pivotal week here for retail sales. We get Best Buy on Tuesday and quite a few others as well, as including Burlington, uh, Kohl's, Abercrombie uh, and Fitch, Lowe's you see there as well, and quite a few others, including, we should point out, Nordstrom and Urban Outfitters. Coming up here, we're going to pivot and take a look at pharmaceutical companies because they are looking for the next big thing in weight loss. and. Apparently, they found it in a little pill. Are you going to take one of these pills, Katie? Probably not. It's yeah. not really my speed, but we'll talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and it's coming up after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. pills, they could be the next big thing in the $100 billion market. Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly both touting pill versions of their blockbuster drugs that could come as soon as next year. Bloomberg's Madison Muller has the story. When it comes to the pill version of these weight loss drugs, I feel like that's the holy grail. 
Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what the drug makers think too, and that's what the drug makers who don't have weight loss drugs also think is the entry point to this market. So we see Pfizer, AstraZeneca, they're saying that pills are going to be the next big thing, and that's their way into this. Look, I get it that, that most people don't want to do a shot, particularly a self-administered shot here, but I was always under the impression that oral medications typically had a somewhat different efficacy just because of the way it breaks down in your body. So are these yeah. pills actually going to be as good as the shot? Yeah, so that's a really good point, and yeah. that's so far what we've seen. That's probably why we don't have a weight loss pill yet. Mm. We have Ribelsis, which is Novo Nordisk's drug, and it's Ozempic in a pill. Okay. But it doesn't cause as much weight loss as Ozempic does. So right now, Novo Nordisk is testing higher versions specifically for weight loss, but it's been harder to get that same efficacy in a pill until now. And, and the pills that are coming do look to be just as effective as the shots. And I mean, okay, so there's the point on efficacy, but even still, I mean, once these weight loss pills come out, what is the market for the shots going to be? Who's going to use those? Yeah, and that's another good point. And the Eli Lilly thinks that still there is going to be a market for these injectables. I mean, there, there's the point of, I guess, injections are less easy to forget than a pill that's taken every single day at the same time, you know, sort of easier to forget. How, how if often you, are they taking the shots? Is the shots are once a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is a little bit easier if you're, you know, yeah. you're someone that tends to forget a pill every single day at the same time. There's also um, at least the pill that Novo Nordisk is making. It, there's some stipulations around like you have to take it on an empty stomach and then you have to wait 30 minutes to eat after and it's just a little bit inconvenient oh. for people. Yeah. A shot might be a little bit easier. So, I mean, I'm just going through uh, the story uh, that you're a part of, and I'm counting at least five or six drug makers now that yeah. apparently are pushing in this space. And, uh, and we were speaking a, a little bit during the commercial break off air about uh, when Viagra came out, and that was like, oh, that was a huge deal yeah. for the pharmaceutical company and that for the pharmaceutical industry, and it became that big blockbuster drug yeah. at the time. And there are people are trying to draw parallels, but I also remember back then there were really only one or two players in that space. It was Pfizer, and I forgot who made Cialis, but yeah. that was pretty much it. Yeah. There's a lot more competition in that space. So does that mean that we are going to start to see uh, more favorable pricing and mm -hmm. are we going to see a faster rush to a generic? Yeah, I mean I think that's the hope. Yeah. At least that's what AstraZeneca's CEO is saying that the pill versions that they're going to make are going to be a lot cheaper. I mean that's still several years off. They're further behind in development. Mm -hmm. But you know that is what we think is going to happen as more drug makers enter this. Hopefully the prices will come down because right now the drugs are still extremely expensive mm -hmm. and just not affordable for most people. Uh, the two major players right now are still Eli Lilly and Novo, Novo Nordisk, and the rest of the drug makers are further behind. But mm -hmm. we're starting to see more and more competition sort of come mm -hmm. into this space. Well, we know that supply has been a concern, particularly for mm -hmm. Novo Nordisk. Would it be easier to manufacture these pills and basically scale up, or how are they thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, ideally, yes. Pills are typically cheaper, easier to store, easier to manufacture. Uh, which is why in the next few years we might be able to see cheaper pills. But right now, Novo Nordisk's drug Ribelsis is the same cost as Ozempic. It costs $900, $936 a month, which is the exact same as Ozempic. So right now the pills aren't any cheaper. Um, over time, it might be able to help these manufacturing issues. However, the drugs, the, the pills take a lot more active ingredient to make. So it's still... Yeah that could be an issue if Novo Nordisk doesn't get a hold of their, their supply issues. Well, Madison, it's great reporting as always. I'm sure we're going to be checking in with you very, very soon. That is Bloomberg's It's like the Madison most popular Moore. person at Bloomberg. Right I know, now. <laughs> I know. The iron is hot and she's striking. Uh, but obviously this is basically all we're talking about, it feels like. And of course, yeah. with weight loss drugs dominating the airwaves, some of our reporters have actually been looking at potential unexpected side effects, uh, namely whether it's what? bad for your marriage. Uh, apparently, bad for my marriage? <laughs> yeah. How so? Well, if you take a look at bariatric surgery, uh, researchers in the U.S. They followed 827 married and 614 single people who got bariatric surgery for five years and found huh. that those who weren't married were twice more than likely, more than twice <laughs> as likely to tie the knot after surgery. So I don't know. Do with that what you will. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. This is, I feel like this is a minefield conversation. But so, so the idea that people lose weight now all of a sudden they look better in theory and they feel feeling better about themselves and all of a sudden they look at their partner and be like, hey, I can do better than you. Is, yeah, that, right? is that what this is I'm about? I'm going to trade up here. What, 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 did they do a study where both spouses were on uh, the weight loss drugs? Because if they both lost maybe weight we'll do that. at the same time, then maybe they both kind of see each other 
for what it is. Well, I, hopefully, hopefully I, someone's yeah. watching who can make that I hope some of these marriages study. are a little less superficial than that, right? <laughs> I know, it's a little <laughs> bit depressing, but uh, in any case, uh, we'll see. But on that front, uh, should we talk about the markets at all? I don't know. I mean, if you want to, if we must. I mean, look, it's an up day. It is an up day, but just barely. Just barely. But look, it's an up week, and we talk about the rally that we've had. And a lot of questions right now, Katie, as to whether it continues heading into next week, a holiday shortened week here in the U.S. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Katie Greifeld, we're looking at modest gains in the market once again on a, the day, but on the week, the gains proved to be meaningful once again. Meaningful once again. Again, we had such fireworks to start mm -hmm. this week. You think about that CPI print that we had all the way back on Tuesday. It feels like actually a month ago. That obviously really reignited bets on this soft landing. Uh, you can see that in the S&P 500 on a weekly basis. You can certainly see it in the bond market as well. Yeah, certainly see it in the bond market here. You talk about the uh, continued buying and the persistent buying, at least on a weekly basis that we continue to see there here. And then you take a look at crude oil, which is trying to bounce back. We should point out, despite the fact that it's up 4% on the day, it's still lower on the week, which I think gives you a real sense here of just how wild uh, the week was. Yeah, and it did fall into a bear market at one point. A yeah. lot of things going on. There were some technical factors as well. I heard Contango bandied about, Ooh, but it's really Contango. supply and demand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Contango is great, right? Yeah. You know, but you want the backwardation. That's my favorite. I've heard um, that that's the thing. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to point out, and I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier about some of the flows that we've been seeing. And I don't know if we can put the chart up here, but there was a great story here about the commodity uh, trading advisors. These are kind of the, the fast money uh, folks, if you will, institutional folks here buying a record seven billion dollars in U.S. equities in the week. But I was even looking at some of the flows into uh, SPY, into the triple Qs and here. And we're sitting on right now where it's going to be one of the biggest inflows on a weekly basis that we've had all year. I think it's going to be the third biggest uh, to be official uh, uh, that we've seen so far this year. And it's not just SPY. I mean, you've also seen money come into junk bond funds, into investment grade credit funds as well. So it really feels, again, that this risk rally. It's extending across mm -hmm. asset classes and people are actually putting some muscle behind it. So we'll see how that pays off. Yeah. But let's talk about some of the individual movers today because we've got a few interesting ones. Charge point. What yeah. a terrible day oh, this stock is having. Yeah. Uh, it's down about 35 percent. Basically, it missed on sales. It also announced the sudden replacement of its longtime CEO. So there's a lot of speculation about what that means necessarily. Uh, but you can see that investors just are giving it a bad grade. And we should point out the miss on that revenue was insane. I mean, it was like, yeah. I think they gave guidance around 113 million. The street was looking for 150. You do the percentage math on that here and you get a sense of why the stock is down 30 percent. Yeah. So they really yeah. uh, packaged all that bad news together. But let's move on here. Let's also talk about applied materials. Of course, they reported yesterday. There was also a Reuters report that broke that uh, they're facing a, a probe by the Justice Department over whether whether or not they sold hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment without proper licenses to uh, China's biggest chip maker. That obviously would violate those export controls. And uh, you can see that's sinking the shot stock down by over 4%. Let's also quickly talk about plug power. Also having mm. a bad day. I don't know why I picked all the, all the losers <laughs> today. But basically, City cut its recommendation uh, to neutral from buy. That's being punished in the market today down by about 3.2%. Those are called vibes. I think I think something something's going on underneath the surface here. I, I wore a pick. red dress. So <laughs> All know. right, we are one hour away from those closing bells. Sit tight. Our cross-platform coverage of the big stories of the day it starts right now. Come down to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're joined right now by our colleagues Scarlett Fu and Bailey Lipschultz. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and our partnership. Carol Masser, of those folks still streaming on YouTube. What did you do, Scarlett Fu, <laughs> with Carol Masser? Carol Masser and Tim Senevic are on a forced holiday somewhere. They're taking some time off. Together? 
Um, I don't know. We'll have to find out from them no, come next week, but I'm guessing no. Uh, you know, I was taking a look at the market, Scarlett, and I was looking at all those big, magnificent seven stocks. Mm -hmm. They're all kind of on the back foot on the day, and that includes, I think, everybody's favorite this year, at least on a percentage basis, and that's NVIDIA. Yeah, and NVIDIA, of course, is going to be reporting earnings next week. It's not until Tuesday, but it's never too early to look ahead to what those results might bring, because, Bailey, the numbers that they've posted in the last two quarters, they smashed analyst estimates. Yeah, they beat expectations, but even this last quarter, we saw a huge beat on revenue by more than 20%, but the stock ended up flat. So when you're the best performer in adding more than $800 million in market cap this year, expectations will be sky high, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in a holiday-shortened week. Yeah, I wonder, though, I mean, we talk about the earnings and when they come out. Is this really a fundamental story? Is this really about the numbers, or is this more so uh, about Jensen Wong and the narrative that he's pieced together for this stock? Yeah, it remains to be seen uh, how that goes over. I do wonder how many times we're going to say holiday shortened week next week because I would imagine it's a lot. But uh, let's Are switch. you against Thanksgiving? I'm not against oh. it necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, but I just I see it in print all the time. But let's talk about the housing market as well. There was a really interesting story out in Bloomberg Business Week that found that almost 40 percent of U.S. homeowners right now own their homes outright as of 2022, looking at the latest data. So the share of Americans who are actually living mortgage free free right now that's an all-time high it's really interesting and it speaks more to the fact that uh, many of these are baby boomers who refinance when rates were super low and now they just own their home well that's what I was gonna say like uh, what's the demographic of that here and I guess that's a good thing and we've talked about this a lot as to why we haven't actually seen a collapse in the housing market given the big rise in rates and look that if you own a house or if you bought one over the last uh, you know 20 years or so either you own it outright or you've got a mortgage rate that is probably most likely below 5%. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it, it's interesting, though, that a lot of people wanted to pay down their mortgage, uh, even if they did have uh, lower mortgage rates. A lot of people want to hold on to those mortgages because of the uh, mortgage interest deduction for their taxes. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing, peace Scarlett, of mind is good, I suppose. Yeah. And the other thing, Scarlett, too, is like, I mean, don't they always financial advisors always tell you that usually your mortgage is probably usually the lowest cost thing you have in terms of borrowing relative to credit cards and yeah. cars and other things like that. So they always say that's the one you should pay down last yeah right because I mean if you're sitting on three percent rate and if you got a credit card that's you know in the double digits you know you would pay that down first before the mortgage yeah absolutely I mean th for th for those who are capable of doing it and who have the the means um, spare a thought for the Millennials who are not in that kind of position thank you Scarlett I appreciate that I was gonna say this is all Greek to me because I don't have a mortgage uh, I pretty much it famously at this point, because Romain keeps bringing it up, was looking, it was in the housing market, and rates are just too high. You do the monthly calculation, and it's just too high. And I think that's the story for a lot of people trying to buy right now. Sellers aren't happy, and buyers certainly aren't happy, Bailey. Yeah, Katie, as someone who just closed and has made, I think, two mortgage payments myself. Wow. congratulations. Um, it is a high interest rate environment, and one thing that does stand out to me and is, is an interesting thing is the number of people selling houses in expensive areas than California. California, out here in New York, New Jersey, and moving to the areas like Texas and Florida, yeah. just given the percentage of new homes that are being sold and paid up front. Yeah, to lower cost areas as well, not just where homes are cheaper, but where the cost of living is a lot lower too. All right, guys, that does it for now. We're going to catch back up with you in about uh, 40 minutes time before we uh, count you down to the close. We'll be back together live on television, on radio, and on YouTube, and on Bloomberg Originals. At 4 p.m., our Beyond the Bell coverage begins when we take you through the, today's market close. And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television, counting you down to the close. Those bells just about 50 minutes or so away. And there's a lot of investor attention right now on artificial intelligence, particularly ahead of those results out of NVIDIA next week that we were just talking about. Shares of NVIDIA have more than tripled over the past year. And our next guest actually has some advice for investors who are looking for a cheaper alternative in that space. Sylvia Jablonski over at Defiance ETFs recommends AMD as a way to play the AI story. Sylvia joins us now for more. A lot of acronyms here, Sylvia, but let's break it down. We talk about the outperformance of NVIDIA. And a lot of people, look, I think everyone thinks NVIDIA is going to be at the forefront of the AI boom. But when you look at the run up in that stock, you have to be looking for something that maybe offers a little bit more value. Why AMD? 
Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Romain. I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, NVIDIA is, is definitely sort of the poster child for machine learning, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence. But the problem is a lot of people just can't afford it anymore. So the reason why I like AMD to access that sector and, you know, kind of the future of tech and innovation is because they're number two on the list. So NVIDIA owns about 90% of the GPU market. AMD owns about 10% of it, and they're trying to take some share from NVIDIA. Um, they are, you know, looking for 9% revenue growth. They're increasing sales in gaming. Gaming's picked up a little bit. They're, you know, they sit in Xboxes and um, some of the gaming stations. They sit in Teslas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, overall, the company's a, you know, sound company, strong financial balance, balance sheet, quality company. Lisa Sue is an innovator, and, you know, they're really capturing share. So I, I think it's a good alternative to NVIDIA if you want to get into that AI trade. Uh, I am curious, though, here too, Sylvia. Uh, I mean, I was just looking through some of your other uh, recommendations or some of the things that you like, and I saw that in the chip space, you also liked Intel. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's sort of a similar story. So Intel has been, you know, kind of a, a sad story for the last couple of quarters. We've been waiting for, you know, Pat Gelsinger to kind of come in and, and, and shake things up and finally see the results of that. And I think this last quarter, you know, you really saw it in the earnings announcement. They they beat on top and bottom line. And finally, it looks like this is turning into, you know, a fixer upper growth story. I, I think that the company is starting to get some tailwinds and they're starting to compete in that space. But, you know, overall, I come from an ETF um, way of thinking. So I think, you know, if you you're looking for access to artificial intelligence, quantum computing, supercomputing, you know, you could also do it that way too, right? If you, if you don't want to sort of stock pick the winner, you can get a basket of semiconductor stocks and the tech stocks like Microsoft that also represent the space in one of these ETFs and just, you know, play the theme that way. Well, Sylvia, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it really feels right now there's a lot of people trying to guess who the winners will be. And it sounds like you're saying that the basket approach, just put them all in a portfolio and you'll probably do OK, is maybe the way to go at this stage of this phase, really this cycle. Yeah, I think so. And, and you know, there's kind of no bad way to do it, right? Because the Magnificent Seven represents so many things beyond AI. They happen to also be you know, the AI leaders in a lot of cases, but these companies are also kind of winning in software, they're winning in data center, they're winning in, in cybersecurity cloud, um, you know, in different types of AI, whether it's Microsoft with 365 Pilot or the chip companies providing running water for AI. So, you know, to your point, I think a lot of these names have run up, they have further to go over time, but I think in the shorter term, if you're looking for a little more bang for your buck and diversification, you might want to get some exposure to the mid cap and small cap names in the AI machine learning space. And in that case, you know, looking at ETFs is a good way to do it. And Sylvia, obviously a lot of focus on NVIDIA, on semiconductors and tech in general right now, but I'm looking over your notes. I also see United Airlines. I see Delta on there. What's going on in that space? Yeah, so it's really interesting because the year started very hot for cruises, for hotels, for airlines. You know, we sort of got back out there. Wages were good. The consumer was strong. You know, markets were, were kind of stable in the beginning of the year, rallying. And then we got that pullback and it kind of coincided with the prices of oil going higher, inflation being a little bit wobbly, you know, a second war coming into the mix and this fear of, you know, uh oh, inflation can go higher. We may have to spend more. And the consumer is essentially going to earn less and spend less on services. But the story of the year has been, you know, spending on services over goods. And now, you know, the picture looks a little bit different. So the Fed is seemingly becoming a little more dovish. Perhaps we don't get, you know, massive amounts of rate cuts right away, but maybe we get one or two next year. And at least we hold and don't raise. Inflation is coming down, price of oil is coming down. And here's the number, 55 million people have booked airline tickets for mm. next weekend in your shortened week. So you can add that to your, your count there, Katie. But um, so, you know, these these companies and, and, the you know, me being one of them, the, the prices of airline tickets are just absolutely absurd to fly a couple hours away from where you live. So I just think that's going to be a tailwind into, you know, for, for companies like United and Delta in, in Q4. That gets to a broader question, though, Sylvia, also about just consumer spending overall. I mean, there's a lot of competition for our dollars, as I'm sure you know, at a time where at least at certain income levels, uh, there are fewer dollars in the pocket. Are you worried at all that consumer spending might not hold up? I think in the long term, it will depend. I think it'll depend on inflation, you know, whether or not inflation continues to go in the right direction. And I think it'll depend on the Fed. Um, so far, you know, in terms of the economy, corporate earnings holding up. 
um, the consumer remaining strong. Like if you look at kind of the pure retail types of stuff like Target, I mean, you're, you're seeing that the consumer is spending. So I think in the short term, you know, my, my kind of call for United and Delta is that I think they're going to have a very solid fourth quarter. Whereas when I think about things like, you know, quantum computing, when I think about AI, these are things that are going to play out in the next you know, from 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 zero to five years, right? So, um, so I think in the near term, the consumer is going to spend, and you know, kind of the tailwinds of the season aren't aren't going to hurt that story. All right, Sylvia, gotta leave it there. Really appreciate your time. Have a great weekend. Thank you. That is Sylvia Jablonski. She is CEO and CIO over at Defiance ETFs. Now, coming up, we'll hear from Dan Center. He is author of The Genius of Israel about the long-term economic challenges the Israel-Hamas war might pose. And in our next sub-segment, where we take a look at small businesses and startups that could be the next big thing, uh, Al Hussein, the founder of investment firm Full Cycle and ever new founder Stacey Flynn, going to be stopping by to talk about a sustainable future for fashion. And organizers forced to hit the brakes on the first practice session of F1's Las Vegas Grand Prix will tell you why they had to throw up the red flag. Stay tuned. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Modest gains in U.S. financial markets here on this Friday afternoon, but that's adding to gains earlier in the week that's setting up for, yes, another big week for equities once again here. Most of your favorites' favorites are higher here on the day, but the big heavy lift that we would normally get from the Magnificent Seven, not quite happening here on the day. Alphabet down a couple percentage points on the day. Microsoft down about one. The net effect of it all is an S&P 500 in the green, but only fractionally. A tenth of a percent gain there, but you are seeing pretty significant outperformance elsewhere. Once again, the Russell 2000. Those small caps, those cyclicals really getting bid here, and that might actually in and of itself be a bullish sign here. The dollar lower on the day and on the week, and of course we talk about the magnificent uh, buying, the, the magnificent rally that we saw in the Treasury space on a weekly basis. Meanwhile, the VIX, well, isn't really doing anything as of right now. Let's get some insights out of Abigail Doolittle for our Options Insight segment as we do every day around this time. And Abigail, I felt like, what, just a month ago, the VIX was above 20, and now we're hovering around 13. It is pretty amazing, uh, the volatility that we've seen for the VIX uh, to the downside as stocks have climbed over the last couple of weeks. And there have been, you know, a few thoughts about this uh, for a while with VIX at complacent levels with so much uncertainty, whether it's the uh, zero-date uh, options, treasuries, offering a 5% yield, so that could be a hedge uh, to a stock portfolio. Let's bring in Brian Vendig, president at MJP Wealth Advisors. Advisors, Brian, great to have you with us. And why is the VIX at a 13 handle when there really is so much uh, uncertainty? It signals complacency, but it's hard to believe that investors could be in complacent in this environment. Thanks, Abigail. Yeah, I think this week was a big move uh, to the down when um, inflation numbers came in slightly below expectations. And we saw a big knee-jerk reaction in the market. And I think a majority of the gains from what we saw this week are, are, are priced in. But I do agree with you that, you know, there's still about a 50 percent chance of a recession over the next six to nine months. And, you know, hearing from the Fed over the balance of the year, most importantly, how they set the tone for 2024, I think is going to affect volatility and the VIX more as we move through the next uh, cycle of Fed meetings and then obviously getting to corporate earnings to kick off the new year. Yeah, it seems like rates are really driving uh, this conversation. Before we turn to bond volatility and that move index, the VIX is at levels right around the, where it was uh, back in September uh, before stocks then uh, dropped and then shot the VIX shot higher to that 20 level that Romaine was just referencing. Do you see any reason to think that that's ahead in the weeks ahead? Well, I, I do agree with you that it is quite surprising that we've, we've hit this level that goes back to September. And then at that point, you know, we saw the market take a leg down. Now, I don't think that that's necessarily in the cards in the short term from a seasonality perspective. But I think to investors, it just reminds all of us not to be complacent, especially in this environment, especially when we still have recession uh, concerns 
as I said before, at a 50% level over the next six to nine months. Yeah, there's so much going on for investors to worry about. Uh, portfolios are probably uh, hedged in some way. And relative to that move index, bond volatility, there's been so much chatter over the last couple of weeks that it remains volatility, uh, that it remains volatile and high, uh, that bonds to some degree, that's where the volatility is driving the market. How do you, outside of, I guess, discovery of where rates really go, uh, is, is that how that uh, relationship gets resolved? And in the meantime, does that mean that stocks, the volatility will increase at some point? Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. We, we track the, the move index uh, uh, put out by Bank of America. And, and look, we've seen a pullback in rates because we saw such an, a large uptick from September into October. And now with, with rates uh, moving back, getting off of that 5% handle on, the, on a 10-year to where we are right now, it's not surprising that we have a double-digit decline uh, in that move index. But from our point of view, because of that uncertainty around which direction do we go, not only in stocks, but also with bond yields based on the outlook for Fed policy, I think hanging around this four and a half you know, level right now that we see, you know, give or take on the 10 years, probably what we'll be for a little while until we get confirmation from the Fed regarding their tone for next year at the end of January. Great stuff. Brian Vendig, president at MJP Wealth Advisors. Thanks for joining us for Options Insight today. And from New York, this is Bloomberg. I think each of the races has a different character and they're very uh, have characteristics which make them unique and special and all worthy. Uh, I do think Vegas is going to be unique in that it's a, a night race down the strip on a Saturday night. I think it's going to be iconic. Uh, the visuals will be amazing. And I am not worried about demand because we have been lucky enough to see interest in Formula One explode here in the U.S. And that was Greg Maffei, the CEO of Liberty Media and the owner of F1, who spoke with us earlier this week about demand for the big race. But that was before the latest snag. Last night, the practice for the Grand Prix was canceled less than 10 minutes into the session. Romain, uh, officials chalked up to a loose manhole cover on the track. Okay. I feel like that is pretty important. Yeah, and this was more than a manhole cover. And I mean, I don't know if we have the footage of when, like, uh, Carlos Sainz drove over that. But you can see the sparks from underneath this car. Yeah. And I think they actually had to award him some points because they basically saying they had de damage like some of his power train that he had to fix. And then they did another practice session at like 2.30 in the morning yeah. to try to get it in. So I guess they'll get this thing sorted out by Saturday night uh, when the race is uh, supposed to take place. Yeah, you would imagine that these drivers really want to practice. They want to get to know the course. They yeah. want to know the turns, et cetera. It's hard to do. Uh, well, you know, maybe that is practice, you know. <laughs> I mean, if they want to practice driving over, you know, things they know the street, where to they avoid. Could just run through Manhattan and, you know, they yeah. put the real test of the car. But it gets to the question, too. I mean, look, I mean, they, they have experience. Obviously, Formula has experience setting up these uh, tracks here. And you just kind of wonder why no one sort of thought to think about this particular hole, whether they just didn't think it was an issue, they didn't think it was protruding enough, but obviously it was that if you're causing sparks when you drive over it. Yeah, I'm glad they, they found it, of course, before the big day. And, uh, you know... Are this, you a big race fan? I'm not, okay. I have to say. Yeah. And uh, I got to say, I'm interested to see whether this converts more U.S. Ver viewers into race fans. I know that Drive to Survive, that was the Netflix yeah. series, right? Drive to Survive. That and was huge. Yeah, and then look, it, it, it's become more popular. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I was a big race fan as a kid. I had uncles who were really into this stuff. And, you know, Formula One, but it was mostly, you know, sock cars, NASCAR, mm -hmm. things like that. And Formula One was kind of, you know, every now and then when you had the really big race, obviously with Indy 500 or something, you would pay attention to that. But you wouldn't pay attention to the European leagues. Yeah. And that's completely changed now. I always just thought of it as European NASCAR. And now I have to recategorize it in my brain. I think, send, please send your angry emails to <laughs> Katie Greifeld at Bloomberg. Net. This is the close on Bloomberg. <laughs>
This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day and in the week, Katie Greifeld, a non-holiday shortened week. A non-holiday shortened week, of course. We get that next week. And you take a look at the end to this week, and it's pretty quiet after a big week. Uh, it's pretty evenly split when you look at the sector level. Up at the top, for once, you do have energy. Of course, it's been a rough run for energy as crude oil continues to slide. It's bouncing today, and you can see that in energy shares as well. Consumer discretionary industrials also having a pretty good Friday. You go down the list, though, you do have some losers, small moves, but losers nonetheless. Real estate, health care off by about two-tenths of a percent. And at the bottom, you do have communication services remain off by about six-tenths of a percent. Not getting a whole lot of help from the Magnificent Seven here on the day only two of those names in the green one of the more important ones Microsoft in the red on the back foot all day long down about a percent here on the day but let's talk about retail for a second because we've gotten a lot of retail reports here and overall the sentiment amongst investors they seem to be encouraged by what they saw Ross stores up almost eight percent here on the day setting up for one of its best weeks going back to February Macy's on a four-day run also up about eight percent as well here heading into that holiday shortened week a holiday shortened week that of course is going to be punctuated by Black Friday at the end. Meanwhile, an interesting story for Advanced Auto Parts, one of the biggest decliners out there right now, down 6% here on the back of a forecast that caused a lot of people, Katie, some real concern. And I do want to bring you some breaking news right now. Out of the world of AI, Sam Altman is leaving OpenAI, of course, the CEO of OpenAI, now stepping away from that role. We're learning that CTO Mira Marathi is going to be appointed interim CEO. Again, just to say that again, Sam Altman leaving OpenAI. We're going <coughs> to continue to follow that story. Of course, OpenAI has uh, really captured the imagination of a lot of Wall Street when it comes to AI, really one of the leaders there. It's going to be interesting to see what Sam Altman's plans are. But again, we'll, we'll bring, bring you more news as we have it. But let's pivot now because we should talk about Miami. It's starting to live up to its new label of the Wall Street of the South as market making businesses such as Citadel established posts in the city. Citadel's founder and CEO Ken Griffin, he weighed in on Miami's future in finance compared to New York. New York is the financial capital of America today and it's New York's to lose. Now having said that, Miami, I think, represents the future of America. Now despite those sentiments, Bloomberg columnist Jonathan Levin is concerned about Miami's ability to enhance its infrastructure and live up to New York City. And I'm thrilled to say he joins us now from Miami, our man on the ground. Just walk us through your argument here and why you're disagreeing with Ken Griffin. Yeah, I gotta say, so, I've long been sort of a Wall Street South uh, skeptic, and I've been proved wrong by a lot of recent uh, developments. You know, you know, like Griffin's arrival uh, brings an incredible amount of momentum to South Florida, and the question is, how do you maintain that momentum going forward? And I, I propose sort of three pillars for uh, sustainable growth of, of this space. The, the first thing is you've got to do something about uh, climate mitigation, something dramatic, right, uh, to send the right signals. Second, you've got to do uh, something about the city's traffic problem. And lastly, you've got to do as much as possible to uh, uh, improve education options here in the region, both in terms of private schools and public schools. Well, let's talk about number two on your list, invest in climate resiliency, because whenever someone trots out, you know, these bullish visions for Miami, the fact that, you know, they are facing rising sea levels, et cetera, extreme weather events, it's very real, Jonathan. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, look, so the, the bottom line is people need to start investing for the long haul right now. And basically what that means is elevate, elevate, elevate. I'm talking about your infrastructure, the things that you can directly control. Uh, but you also need to raise to the highest possible standards immediately uh, all those building codes and things, things like that. When people are putting in new homes and businesses, they need to be essentially bunkers uh, for uh, you know, the worst possible outcomes over the next uh, 50 years. So I am curious, though, too. I mean, this gets to a broader question about whether some of the changes that we saw, geographic changes, if you will, uh, aren't necessarily going to be as lasting. I know there was that fever dream that Miami could be uh, a replacement, if you will, although Ken Griffin seemed to make it clear that it's going to more augment what we have in New York here. But was that maybe just done a little, uh, kind of gone too far too fast, John? 
I definitely think it's over overdone. I, I mean, look, in the status quo in which we operate right now, Miami is is basically a New York suburb, right? Miami does not exist without uh, without New York. Uh, and so, you know, Miami's special relationship with New York was certainly augmented during the pandemic because we were all doing a lot more uh, work from home and yeah. we changed our lifestyles in, the, in that, that regard. But at this moment, that you know, this notion of Miami somehow replacing mm -hmm. uh, New York, the financial center of the universe is, is still quite, quite uh, fantasy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Jonathan Levin uh, down in Miami, a closer look at the Wall Street of the South. But we need to get back to some big breaking news that just crossed the wire, learning that Sam Altman is leaving OpenAI. And we now have a few more details on this. We're learning that the decision was not voluntary, that the board asked uh, uh, him to leave. This follows a review process uh, by the board in which they found that they no longer have confidence in Altman's ability. They also said, again, this is coming from an official statement by OpenAI, that Altman not consistently candid in his communications and that they have now lost confidence in his ability. There's a lot that we don't know right now, Katie Greifeld, about what's going on here, but we talk about sort of one of the most prominent people to emerge this year uh, on, on the back of one of the most prominent stories in financial markets, open AI, artificial intelligence, and more importantly now, Microsoft's investment in that company as well as the investment by others. Yeah, we're talking about a pioneer in AI and you think about open AI and how big it is. It has been in talks to sell employee shares to investors at a valuation of $86 billion. That would make the company one of the largest startups in the world. Of course, this is a private company, so there's no share reaction, but you take a look at Microsoft. We know that Microsoft has invested heavily in uh, open AI. Right now, shares are down about 1.7 7%. The reaction was quick there, down as much as 2%. Of course, uh, surprising investors, and we're going to get more on this, I hope. Sam Altman being removed, the CEO of OpenAI, the board, saying they don't have confidence in his communication. We're going to get you more details immediately. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, of course, we do have some breaking news to bring you. This about OpenAI, the big news uh, crossing the terminal. Sam Altman is leaving OpenAI. Of course, he's one of the most prominent figures in artificial intelligence. Uh, this is coming from the company's board. In the interim, you're going to have the chief technology officer step into his place, and the search for a permanent replacement yeah. is ongoing. Roman. We should also point out here, also the chairman of the board, Greg Brockman, is also stepping down here. So although they will say that Greg Brockman will remain at the company here, but uh, interesting moves here, and, and we don't want to speculate, we don't actually know what's behind this, but Sam Altman being removed, and we should use that word removed, because they made it clear that this was the result of a board decision, a board review, in which they felt uh, that they did not uh, have confidence anymore in the way Sam Altman was communicating. Rachel Metz is the reporter on that story, joining us right now uh, to talk a little bit more about this. Rachel, what do we know? Why was this review taking place to begin with? We actually at this moment don't know all that much. We we know, as, uh, as you were just talking about, that he was removed. It doesn't sound like it was voluntary. Um, there was a statement, and apologies if you if you already went into that, and I, and I just didn't hear that bit, but um, they say his departure follows a deliberative review process, as you mentioned, which concluded he wasn't consistently candid in his communications with the board, um, hindering its ability to exercise its responsibilities. Um, so, I mean, they clearly, ha and as they say, they have lost confidence in his ability to continue leading the company, yeah. um, which I, I think we're going to probably find out a little more, and we're obviously looking into figuring out what exactly yeah. led to this. Well, I'm sure, um, so well, I'm, sure yeah. I'm sure. everyone right now is calling the company trying to figure out what the heck is going on. But I'm wondering if you, maybe you can shed a little bit of light here on some of the moves that the company has made as of late. We know that they were in talks to raise a new, uh, with a new funding round that would give this company just an eye-popping valuation of uh, some more than uh, $80 billion here. Do we have any sense as to whether his removal uh, as well as uh, effectively the chairman of the board uh, stepping down from that particular position are, is going to have a material impact on that fundraising round. 
one one could guess that it would. I mean, that's these are both very big deals, right? Especially Sam Altman, who has really been the leader of the company through an extremely pivotal time for it. Um, I mean, ChatGPT came out uh, almost exactly a year ago at this point, in like another week or week and a half. That's going to be a year from now. And as we all know, that itself has really changed the AI and uh, industry and technology industry at large. So. Him, uh, Sam leaving and Greg stepping down but remaining in that position, we should keep in mind Greg was a co-founder of OpenAI. Um, Sam has, has, was not a co-founder, but he has been there, um, I, I think, this entire time. It, these are really, really big shifts for a company that uh, has had a pretty stable leadership for quite a while. Yeah, monumental moves here. And, of course, with Sam Altman departing OpenAI, Chief Technology Officer Myra Maradi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, will be the interim Chief Executive Officer. Rachel, what do we know about uh, that role, the, C the CTO? Uh, Mira Maradi has been at the company for quite a while now. She is well-known and respected in AI, in the technology industry at large. Um, she has been already leading several of the key teams at OpenAI. And I would say that over the last, like, six months or so, the company has certainly been positioning her as more of a public face of the company. She's been more of a public leader, um, doing things like attending events, with Sam um, at the Wall Street Journal's uh, Tech Live event about a month or two ago, she was on stage in conversation with him, um, things like that, uh, making it seem like she was certainly one of the top, top leaders of the company. And you think about open AI, you zoom out, you think about how important this company is to the AI landscape. I mean, the company said in November, what, 100 million people use chat GBT each week, more than 90 percent of Fortune 500 businesses building tools on the platform. Talk to us about uh, the potential ripple effects here if we do see a hiccup at open AI. Yeah, no, that's a really that's a really good point. I mean, I think you have a lot of companies that are increasingly depending on this company, a lot of companies that are experimenting with and increasingly relying on this company. Um, that could have big, it could have a big impact on how they feel about this company if this kind of leadership change is made. Uh, 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 sorry, because this kind of leadership change was made and mm -hmm. the way in which it was made, which is you know it's Friday afternoon right before a yeah. holiday, you know, like that doesn't it, it sounds pretty bad. All right, uh, Rachel, uh, great uh, reporting here, and I'm sure we'll talk very soon here. Rachel Metz, one of the reporters on this story with Sam Altman, the co-founder of OpenAI, behind ChatGPT being forced out by the board. Also learning that his co-founder, Greg Brockman, who had been chairman of the board, will step down as chairman but remain with the company. Stick with us. We're going to be back in a moment, counting you down to the close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Katie Greifeld setting up for what's going to be a second straight week of gains for the S&P 500, though the gains on the day somewhat tepid. Yeah, another quiet day. Uh, it's really been quiet days since we saw that big CPI print. You can see uh, remarkably unchanged when it comes to the S&P 500 volume down as well. A pretty good week, though, for a lot of the retail stocks here. I think the expectations were low, so that's why you're maybe seeing the pops and names like Etsy up 3 percent, Macy's up more than 7 percent. And we've been talking a little bit earlier about applied materials down about four. But flip of the board real quick here, because this is actually we're seeing a resumption here of the rally in the Treasury market that had pushed yields down. But if you remember, just about a month or so ago, we were talking about the big Treasury sell-off, and there was so much speculation about what was behind that sell-off and whether it was those evil foreign <laughs> buyers who had stopped being buyers. Well, we finally got confirmation here. Backward-looking data, Kata, and it's hard to see from the chart there, but at the bottom uh, right of the screen there, you see that you actually did see a pullback from foreign buyers uh, for the first time in quite some time. And you think about all the ructions that we saw over the summer uh, continuing into September, and maybe that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you think about the, the lack of buyers in the market. You have the Fed out of the equation, foreigners mm -hmm. as well. Who's left to buy? Households, et cetera, institutions. But obviously we're seeing a big rally now. Yeah, absolutely here. Uh, let's get you some insights here from our next guest as we move closer to the closing bell. Linda Dissel joining us right now, senior equity strategist over at Federated Hermes. Linda, always pleasant to see your face here. I uh, want to get your thoughts on what's been going on uh, in the markets as of late, particularly when it comes to economic conditions, because I was looking at the earnings reports that we got out of some of the retailers. They certainly weren't as bad as people thought. The official retail sales data we got this week, that got this week s showed a contraction, but also showed a lot of positive signs that consumer resiliency is still there. 
Yeah, I think it's been true all year that we've been underestimating the consumer and the strength of the consumer. Uh, so much debate about the excess savings that they had coming into this year and how quickly they were whittling that down. Um, it's It really, I think $9 trillion in total had been printed, so that was a lot of money to be spent. And we're not sure how much is left, but it definitely seems like it can take us through to the end of this year. And maybe you don't see trouble that way for the consumer until next year, and certainly don't you don't see trouble as long as the unemployment rate stays as low as what it is. I, I want to get your thoughts as well on the other big data point that I think we've all kind of forgotten about, which was the CPI report. This seemed to show uh, a resumption in that disinflationary trend. And yeah, the typical asterisk, one report does not make a trend here. But I'm curious as to whether you were actually encouraged uh, by that report as well as the PPI the next day. Well, it's encouraging to see the CPI figure come down closer to where the Fed would like it. And, um, and but that was predictable that it would be what we've been really concerned about. And I know what the Fed has been concerned about is uh, shelter costs, which I think are coming down very handsomely, which will probably continue to do so thanks to the rental property situation. But then still we have the wage concern and the Atlanta Fed wage tracker is still up there on 5%. So that is a very strong number and it is not commensurate with the 2% a number that the Fed wants. I think it was very interesting and I know the AI story came up and that's big news. What I thought was really for potentially big news and very interesting news this week is is that word, that D word coming out of Walmart, deflation, and what that might mean for earnings next year. That could be a big deal. That's exactly where I wanted to go, so I'm glad you brought up the D word, uh, deflation. How real of a risk is that, though? You think about the realm of possibilities that could await us in 2024. How high is deflation on that list? Well, deflation isn't anything that many of us have been talking about at all. Of course, we know that you've got services and goods and services where the trouble has been. Um, we know that corporate earnings surprised for the first three quarters of this year on the upside, and that was largely because the profit margins held in, because any expenses that companies had, they could feed that through to consumers or whomever was buying their goods and services, and they would pay for that. So if indeed we're starting to see a slowdown, I think we can all agree there's a slowdown happening or coming. Maybe it's still growth, but still a slowdown. Well, then when do they start laying off people? When do they start seeing that the deflation numbers are not good for the revenue line at all. And mm -hmm. that's bad news for profit margin. That's bad news for the bottom line. Maybe they start laying off people. And so I think much as we've seen rolling recessions here in, the, in these last couple of years, we may see that into next year. And then it will potentially get more bumpy again. Deflation could show its head in certain parts of our economy. So that's the perspective sort of from the company side. What about for investors? I mean, we talk a lot about what your inflation portfolio, what your inflation playbooks should look like. What about when it comes to deflation? Well, deflation, disinflation is a good thing. It allows uh, consumers dollars to go further. And we really do appreciate that. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's kind of as I, I travel every week, I talk to groups and I say, who doesn't love potato chips? Everybody loves potato chips. And if you buy a bag of potato chips today, it costs 50 percent, five zero more than it did before COVID. And if you say that inflation figure is coming down to zero and I still have to pay 50 percent more, that's why people are in such a bad mood. Why are you in a bad mood? You have a job. You still have good money uh, to spend there. I'm in a bad mood because I can't believe the sticker shock and so quickly. And so that's where deflation would be a very good thing for consumers and their confidence and really help us stave off a, rece a recession next year. How much confidence do you have right now in, I guess, the trajectory of markets? I mean, we've had, we're sitting on what's going to be one of the better years, believe it or not, for uh, U.S. equities, despite all the gloom and doom that has kind of uh, uh, been hanging over us here. And I, I am curious as to uh, when you look at those gains and the potential for some sustainability of that rally into next year, uh, is there enough evidence that we can or at least maybe should count on that? Well, no, there isn't, because we know it's largely the Magnificent Seven that did it. Uh, we're, we're, we can be fans of the Magnificent Seven. They're extremely, uh, very, very um, successful companies, lots of cash flow. That's all good. But when the rest of the market has been basically left behind, what needs to happen next year 
and very well could happen next year, is a real broadening of this market. Because if I strip away that magnificent seven, the price earnings ratio for the median company for next year's earnings is maybe 14, 15 times. That is not bad when you consider an, or an inflation rate that's coming down below 3%. That could really be good news for next year. That's what we're rooting for, as well as those profit margins to hold in. All right, Linda, always great to talk to you. Linda Dissel over at Federated Hermes. Stopping by to help us count down to those closing bells, which are just about three minutes away, Katie Greifeld. And it's interesting, too, because I was taking a look once again at the Russell 2000. Mm. It's up 1.3% on the day, and the outperformance is massive relative to the rest of the indices. That's actually extremely surprising. I feel like the small caps, the Russell 2000, they tend to march to the drum of their own beat. That's certainly happening today because on the big, broad index level, the S&P 500, it's a snooze fest. Yeah, absolutely here. And we talk about some of the moves in the rest of the markets, including in treasuries. The downdraft that we continue to see in the dollar has a lot of folks questioning some of the more bullish positioning out there. Stick with us. We're going to break down all the cross-asset moves on the day and on the week. Our full market coverage right here as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Scarlett Fu and Bailey Lipschultz. In today for Tim Stenevich and Carol Masser. Welcome to our audiences in full across all of our Bloomberg platforms on a day where equities, once again, Scarlett, are in the green on the day and on the week. Yeah, the path of least resistance is for stocks to move higher or in the case of the last few days, inch higher at this point. There was a little bit of wobbling. We saw Microsoft shares extend their losses on that open AI headline, but it does look like a fourth straight day of gains here for the S&P 500. Yeah, absolutely here. And we should just reiterate that open AI headline, of course, with Sam Altman uh, basically being forced out. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Rachel Metz reporting uh, that the board had undertaken a review process of, I guess, something. And they basically determined that they weren't confident uh, going forward here and leaving him at the helm of that company. We concluded that uh, Chappie GPT might have written the press release because it was kind of hard to understand. <laughs> I don't know. It was a little bit brutal. You read through the lines there, and uh, again, it made it just very clear that this wasn't Sam Altman's decision. Really interesting to think about the ripple effects here. Obviously, Microsoft uh, being one of them, but you think about the Fortune 500 companies, 90% of them are building on open AI. So it's a very systemically important company as well. And this was someone who was very much at the forefront of AI and talking to politics about what this application could actually do. So I'm also interested to see what this means in the entire AI community with Sam Alton getting the boot at this company. Yeah, absolutely. And we should point out, we don't have a lot of details about exactly what the board took issue with, but I think as Bailey alluded to here, I think everyone wants to know whether it dovetails at all with the rest of the AI space or this is something very specific to OpenAI and ChatGPT. We get the closing bells here in New York. Green all around the screen, though we should point out the gains are relatively modest. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up by about two points as we wait for the numbers to settle. That's going to be good enough to push it into the green, but we're talking about a tenth of a tenth of a percent gain on the day. The S&P 500 up for a second week, up today about a tenth of a percent or about five to six points, while the Nasdaq is higher by about 12 points or a tenth of a percent. But let's talk about the Russell 2000 Scarlet here, a 1.3 percent gain on the day, more outperformance relative to the broad market. And I was just taking a look on a weekly basis. The Russell 2000 outperforming the S&P 500 on a <coughs> weekly basis by more than three percentage points. That's the widest margin to the upside for the Russell versus the S&P going back to early 2022. Yeah, something to definitely watch for. Uh, I'm looking at the S&P 500 right now and you have 328 stocks higher, 171 down. So clearly the, uh, the tilting is to the upside. And you take a look at how it breaks down on the industry group level. You do have more green than red, but again, it was a pretty quiet day in the markets. But energy up at the top, up by more than 2%. We know that crude oil bouncing back a little bit right now. Uh, four straight weeks of losses, though, entering a bear market yesterday, yeah. but bouncing around right now. Retail also having a good day. Uh, transportation and banks as well. Then you go down the list. What's not doing well, media and entertainment, household products, and then software and services <laughs> 
leading the rear down by about nine tenths of a percent. And before, Scarlett, you get into some of the movers, I just want to correct myself. I did say that the S&P 500 had gained for a second straight week. It is indeed a third straight week of gains on the S&P, Scarlett. All right, let's take a look at some of those retailers that Katie highlighted. Uh, we'll start with Gap, GPS, rallying the most since June of 2020, up uh, more than 30 percent to 17.85. Its first full quarter under the new CEO, Richard Dixon, seems to be one that investors like because it reported better than expected third quarter results. Uh, comp sales at Old Navy unexpectedly rising. So that was a little bit of a surprise given that Athleta is, an, is really the growth engine of Gap, but uh, that didn't happen this past quarter. Gap, though, is a shadow of its former self with sales contracting in six of the last eight quarters overall. When's the last overall. time you've been in a Gap, Scarlett? I have not been in one for, in forever because the one that is across the street or was across the street from <laughs> yeah, the Bloomberg was. office <laughs> closed during the pandemic, and I haven't been in one since. Yeah, so did the too. Banana Republic. I love Banana Yes, Republic. exactly. Part of the Gap empire or former empire. Another big gainer uh, of the day was Ross Stores, the best performer in the S&P 500. Uh, you could see they're closing better than 7%, touching the high since May of 2021. It had a beat and raise quarter. It did strike a cautious tone for this quarter, which is fairly consistent with what we've heard from a lot of retail including Walmart, but analysts still say that off-price is a very strong segment and will continue to gain market share from department stores and specialty retailers. Anyone go to Ross stores here? No, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in. I, I mean, I did go to one like way back when. And it just wasn't really my bag, but I, I see the appeal. You're I, not a treasure hunter? I am not, no, oh. not at all. My wife goes to like TJ Maxx every other day, I feel like. <laughs> so. She bought home like this pot the other day. I was like, we don't need another pot. She's like, but it was on sale. I was like, everything is on Everything's sale. Everything's on Can't sale. Can't argue there. with that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let me just round up the last uh, gainer here. It's Expedia after Evercore upgraded the stock to outperform. An analyst there says uh, the stock is at a fundamental inflection point with revenue growth set to accelerate next year and margins set to expand. Uh, by the way, Expedia is already up 48% so far this year. Today, ending up higher by 5%. I just want to point out that Ross Stores is more than seven times the size of Gap. So when you're thinking about <laughs> retailers that matter, keep that in That's mind. That's great wow. context. But in a, day, in a week that, as Romain mentioned, third weekly gain for the S&P 500, a number of underperformers, worst performer in the S&P, was applied materials dropping 4% this coming after a report that a U.S. criminal investigation uh, of, for allegedly violating export restrictions to China. So it bounced back from those lows, but the impact of that probe overshadowing earnings that really beat analyst expectations across the board, gave a strong guidance. Stock's still up more than 50% year to date, but a big lag for applied materials on a day that, for the most part, you saw semiconductor stocks trading higher among the worst performers. Also in the S&P 500, Bath & Body Works, guys. This is a company that had a lot of pull it forward in demand during COVID, right now dropping more than 3% after third quarter sales decline. Warning revenues also going to drop year over year in the fourth quarter. Analysts calling out consumer spending, slowing, and how they're showing greater pressure into the year end. And again, that coming after two years where everyone was doing something to get their hands on soap. On, on soap. Uh, just uh, before we move on to what's happening in the yield space on the day and on the week, Bailey, I do want to go back to that open AI story with Sam Altman uh, being removed by the board as CEO. Microsoft, of course, the primary investor in this company, out with a statement saying that it stands behind open AI, that it is committed to the company and that it has a long term partnership uh, with the company. Uh, that's all we know right now. Once again, the headline that we broke just a little while ago is that Sam Altman out as CEO of the company that he co founded and his co-founder Greg Brockman who was chairman of the board has been also stepped down from the board though he is still going to remain with the company. I do want to go back to what happened in the yield space because it was another wild day here. We talk about uh, I guess that relentless rally and it continued here. It was a mixed bag on the day here. You see the yield on the two year yield uh, up about six basis points uh, basically the 10 year unchanged on the day but on a weekly basis here we're talking about drops in the double digits uh, in terms of basis points about 17 lower on the 30 year yield 21 basis points lower on the week for the 10 year yield. And I know that we've seen a huge rally uh, when it comes to the bond market, particularly, of course, all eyes on the benchmark 10-year yield. But I think some perspective is important here. I mean, you think about where we entered the year. It was a heck of a lot lower, uh, below 4% right now. Of course, we got below 350 uh, earlier this year. So the fact that we're still meaningfully above 4%, you think about uh, what that means for some of the businesses out there who are facing their maturity walls, refinancing risks, et cetera, that have to tap the bond market that don't have a choice, and that's painful. It is painful, but uh, there's a lot more interest rate volatility to come given what we've seen. I'm 
excited about what's to come next week because the poster child of AI. It's a holiday shortened week. <laughs> <laughs> it's a holiday shortened week, but also AI's, um, AI poster child NVIDIA will be reporting yeah. results. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be an interesting week, too, because we also talk, I mean, we should also point out this is typically a low volume week, obviously, uh, because of the uh, Thursday being a holiday and then everyone taking off Friday. So I do wonder what the market reaction is going to be to a stock that is already, you know, up 200 and something percent. And like, what can they say, Scarlett, that's really going to like provide an upward catalyst? Another three digit percent increase in sales, maybe? Yeah. They're buying open AI? I don't know. <laughs> something, <laughs> something crazy? I don't know. Guys, I just want to point out that the NASDAQ is about three points off of its year highs. So as yeah. you mentioned, Romain, NVIDIA is the fourth largest holder or the fourth largest member of the NASDAQ 100. Granted, they beat earning or revenue by 20 percent last quarter and moved one tenth of one percent. Yeah. But if this company gets moving higher, we are going to have 52 week highs going into the holiday. Yeah, it's certainly the leader in this market. I mean, uh, hands down. So it'll be interesting to see how much juice it's got left. I should point out, too, we get a lot of other earnings, including from some of the retailers like uh, Nordstrom, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch, Urban Outfitters, uh, as well as some other tech companies like HP Inc., as well as uh, Auto desk. Yeah, all those specialty retailers who are going to be losing market share to Ross Stores and TJX, <laughs> as we were talking about earlier. Yeah, but but, but, but then we, what, you saw the Macy's uh, results, and I do wonder, I mean, our department stores still kind of just, I mean, I don't want to say they're back, but are, are they, are they maybe, do we sort of uh, call their death maybe a little bit too prematurely? I mean, people go there, they check out the displays, they look at the holiday decorations. They do the perfume samples, yeah. you know, right. speaking for myself. Speak, is that what you do for you every <laughs> night you go out? It just smells great, yeah. <laughs> they hang out with the personal shopper, you know. You know, you're, you know you're supposed to actually buy something, no. Katie, after they spray it on you. No, no. You, know? not. you just move on. <laughs> That's what I use Amazon for. You take a picture Ouch. of it and then you go home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but anyway, I mean, that's the, those are the big events next week, right? I, I don't know, Scarlett. I mean, I know you love Fed speak, but I think the Fed members, I hope, are on vacation next week. Yeah, I think they yeah. could take a break. Yeah. I think, I think we'll be okay. I think we know what they're going to say anyway. Yeah. Take a beat, yeah. <laughs> take a beat. All right, guys, that does it for us. Uh, our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television, radio, and YouTube. We'll be back on Monday at the same time, same place. And stick with us here on The Close. We continue our coverage here on Bloomberg Television with a look at how some of the world's largest asset owners are allocating capital and managing risk in an environment that, of course, is so uncertain. We're going to speak to the U.S. Chief Investment Officer over at Mercer about their report. That's coming up next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Another interesting week for U.S. equities. The S&P 500 posting modest gains on the day, but more meaningful gains on a weekly basis. And I was taking a look here at just how far this rally has come. Remember, just about three weeks ago, you had an RSI, a 14-day RSI on the S&P 500 that was in oversold conditions below 30. And now we're flirting right now with overbought conditions right around that 70 level. And quite frankly, you would have to go back at least three or four years to find a flip-flop that came so fast and so furious. Nevertheless, some investors are willing to take it. You flip it up and you look at some of the weekly gains that we have in other parts of the market, including on the NASDAQ and including that massive outperformance that we saw in the Russell 2000, a 5.5% gain on the week here, not only besting the NASDAQ 100 as well as the S&P, but the Dow and almost everything else in between. That is the meaningful sort of rally that I think a lot of people want to see, something with a bit more breadth, something with a bit more than just the Magnificent Seven. A big part of that was because of what we saw when regional bank stocks and and, of course, as a group, they were up uh, by about 6 to 7 percent. The KBW Bank Index you're looking at right there, up about 7 percent here on the day. And as far as some of the individual movers on the week, we talk about a huge turnaround for Target, posting one of its best week in a long time, one of the more beaten down stocks, really trying to reassert itself on the back of a relatively encouraging earnings report, an earnings report that was less about revenue growth and more about cost controls. A similar story at Gap, maybe a turnaround is afoot. The new CEO there really trying to right that ship, a 32 percent gain on the week for Gap. Meanwhile, two interesting stories that had really been some bright spots early. Cisco dropping 9 percent on the week in Celsius, which we've been talking a lot about, a big performer. In fact, one of the best outperformers over the last year, down 13 percent on the week, Katie. 
All right, well, let's switch gears here because Mercer is out with its large asset owner barometer for 2024. Now, that surveys over 60 large asset owners to shed light on key investor sentiments. And here to go through some of the insights, I'm thrilled to say we have Mercer's U.S. Chief Investment Officer, Ola Olu Aganga. Great to have you with us on this Friday afternoon. And let's start there. What are some of the big tech takeaways from this year's report? Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll talk about four main takeaways. Um, so the first is large asset owners in general, given the backdrop, uh, they are looking to trim some of the places that are viewed as overvalued. Mm -hmm. So that would be, uh, or having more challenging periods, so U.S. equities, uh, U.K. equities, and real estate. So that's the first takeaway where they're looking to trim. Mm -hmm. The second takeaway is where they're looking to add. Now, about two-thirds of those respondents, so large asset owners, $5 billion and up, $2 trillion in assets, they're looking to add in private equity, private credit, um, and, and real assets. So two-thirds of the respondents there. Mm -hmm. Now, third takeaway, if you double-click on the real assets bit, 54% of respondents said they're looking to add infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about infrastructure. I've talked to a number of folks about yeah. infrastructure with uh, a lot of the government spending and yeah. policies here, Job Act, Repower EU, the opportunity set for infrastructure is much wider. Um, but the last takeaway, and then I'll probably segment into um, more recent yeah. topics, is where they're concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 36% are concerned about stagflation, 32% about geopolitics, mm -hmm. which you would expect, and then 26% about the volatility in the markets. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit about stagflation because it's not something we hear about right now, and especially given that it seems like the news of the week, at least when it comes to the U.S. economy, is soft landing. Everyone's buying back into that thesis. Interesting that uh, stagflation is so high on the list there. Yes, that, that, that actually was a bit of a surprise for us because, of course, if you think stagflation, high unemployment, high inflation, we do have high inflation is coming down, but high employment, not so much. Now, if you were to think of the outlook, and this is a shameless plug, uh, Mercer just came out with the 2024 uh, economic and market outlook. Mm -hmm. The first is actually normalization. So it's inflation coming down. Mm -hmm. It is uh, with inflation coming down, we're starting to see unemployment, obviously, um, at, at regular levels and real wages going up. So that's one of the takeaways from our 2024 outlook. It's mm -hmm. more normalization rather than stagflation. I, I want to go back to something you were just uh, mentioning there about infrastructure, yes. because I feel like I've had this infrastructure conversation every other year or something. It seems like infrastructure is going to be the next big thing. And then you don't see it, at least not at the government level, you don't necessarily see uh, the same follow through here and that trade kind of fades here. What's giving people confidence that this time is different? I mean, this time, the, the policy action that's happened and the dollars that are being spent is big, mm. right? So this has been signed into law if you think of the JOBS Act. Mm. Now, I will agree with you, infrastructure by definition is a long-term asset. So mm. if you think of private markets, you need 10 years, 15 years for some of those things to come into play. Mm. So from an asset owner perspective, you have to have a longer time horizon. Mm. So there's a little bit more patience that is required for infrastructure. It's also certainly so. That would be an understatement. What's the, I mean, what's the general feel though right now about uh, the rate environment and more really just kind of the cost of capital. I mean, uh, you know, we don't have to go into all the weeds of what the Fed is going to do next here. But if you do believe that the baseline, the benchmark uh, rates out there are going to remain where they are for quite some time, doesn't that have to change your investment thesis? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back into the shameless plug a little mm -hmm. bit. But um, so as we start thinking of normalization, what does that mean with regards to the Fed? Mm -hmm. You have to see some slowing of the economy. So we're seeing that, mm -hmm. you know, already all those slower. Yeah. But you have to see slowing of the economy in order to bring inflation down. Right. Now, if you start bringing inflation down, you start bringing down um, uh, and you start slowing down the economy. It means, by definition, a number of other areas within the economy and economic data needs to fall into place as well. Now, we think we'll avoid a recession. Mm -hmm. um, we think we'll narrowly avoid a recession because there's been a lot of resiliency within the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, cost of capital is high now, but you have to be able to slow down the economy. It's expected. I want to talk to you about what I found most surprising in these results, the fact that half of the large asset owners that uh, you surveyed, they aim to significantly increase allocations to sustainable investment strategies. And I found that so surprising because I track ETF flows really carefully. And this year alone, you've seen $7.7 .7 billion come out of ESG strategies. That is by far a record. You've seen a number, a record number of ESG fund closures. So uh, that kind of flies in the face of what we're actually seeing in the data? So the data that we have with the large asset owner survey, this is global. 
Mm -hmm. um, so from a U.S. standpoint, yes, like there may not necessarily be as much of a focus. And of course, we're starting to see the fund flows may be a little bit different for that. But the U.S., although it's a large economy, the rest of the globe um, and a number of areas, especially in Europe and beyond, you think Australia is very, very focused on sustainability. And those asset owners are increasing and actually making a core part of their portfolios. So this is still a, a, a global large asset owner survey with mm -hmm. the U.S. being a little different. Well, I'd be remiss in, in letting you go without asking you about about geopolitics and geopolitical conditions. As we know, uh, there's a lot going on in the world from whether you're talking about the war in Ukraine, uh, now the war in Israel, yeah. whether it's the dysfunction here in uh, the U.S. with regards to uh, our, our Congress here. Uh, how much does that factor in to the outlook that, that these folks have? So the immediate action is a decrease in risk appetite because mm. it creates uncertainty and everyone t takes a step back and, and pauses. Mm. But as we've seen in the data and year after year, every time these things happen, it's either a spike in the volatility index, decrease in risk appetite, but it dissipates. Mm. So from a long-term investment perspective, we haven't seen any noticeable um, changes or effects, so we wouldn't recommend the clients make any changes. All right. It was great to talk to you, uh, by you, the way. Sir. And this is a very interesting report. Alalu Alganga over at Mercer uh, breaking down, I guess, uh, the feeling, the mood, the vibes, Katie Greifeld, if you will, uh, going on out there. Vibes are important. In, in the world. All right. Stick with us. We are going to stay global here, talking a little bit more about what's going on in Japan, one of the best performing broader markets out there in the world. The big question is, what's really driving that and does it continue? Masa Takeda is a portfolio manager over at the Hennessy Japan Fund, a longtime investor in that space. He's stopping by the program next. This is Bloomberg. The Japanese yen showing signs of further strength against the dollar. Investors appearing a bit more confident about China growth stabilizing its tensions with U.S. and Japan simmer. Masa Takeda is here in the studio to share his insights on investing in Japan. He's a portfolio manager over at the Hennessy Japan of Fund. Uh, this is probably, I think, I, to us, at least here in the U.S., probably one of the more stealth stories. The outperformance that we've seen uh, in uh, Japanese equities and, for that matter, the strength that we've been seeing in the yen. Let's start off with the FX space here and what actually has been driving that. Is this a yen story or is this more a dollar story? Well, so I think the common narrative is that the Fed has been raising rates and BOJ keeping it flat. So the interest rate differential has been widening and it's causing yen depreciation. But I think another uh, reason for that, I think, is just if you look at the current account balance of the country, I mean, we had current account surplus for so many years and always the you know, net export nation, there's a lot of trade surplus. But if you look at today the composition of it, yes, we are still in current account surplus, but the trade balance is negative. But what's keeping in surplus is actually investment income. Mm -hmm. Now, investment income, we're talking about investment securities, um, foreign direct investments made by Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. Now, investment income does not get repatriated back into Japan. So okay. if you look on the on a cash flow basis, mm -hmm. um, the actually current account balance is in negative. Mm -hmm. And I think that's causing uh, less and less demand for, for JPY. Uh, I, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, kind of the releasing, or if you will, of yield curve control. There's been a lot of discussions about rates in Japan actually finally getting back into positive territory. And if at all, that's going to change how investors in Japan view foreign assets. So over the last few, few years, um, unfortunately, Japanese household investors, um, they didn't have faith in their own country. So slowly they've been putting money outside of bank deposits to equities, but mostly in S&P 500 because mm -hmm. of the outstanding performance of the last 10, 15 years. Um, with the rise, with the yen, uh, sorry, with the rates rising um, and with the inflation um, uh, you know, progressing in Japan, and the economy may start to accelerate further, then it might be good for the Japanese equities. And hopefully, Japanese households will start to put more money into the Japanese equities because we have, we're talking about like $15 trillion of household financial assets, liquid financial assets. That's mm -hmm. a lot of financial assets. So maybe Japanese investors uh, bring that 
that bias back to their home equities. What about when it comes to bond markets, though? Because especially over the summer, there was a lot of concern that uh, foreign investors are dumping treasuries. They're staying home. A lot of those fears centered around Japan. How much weight do you put to those theories out there? Well, so um, now that um, uh, long yields are on the rise, now we are, we are now looking at 10-year yields of around 1%. So, and then there's a lot of money uh, staying on the sidelines. If you look at Bank of Japan's balance sheet, uh, about $4 trillion of uh, Bank of Japan's account deposits uh, earning zero interest or even negative interest. And so those are uh, waiting to be put back into the JB, JGB markets. Now, because the supply is more limited, there's more cash waiting on the sidelines, that might suppress the long-term yields um, but obviously, you know, fixed income investment is starting to make more sense for companies like life insurers or even banking institutions. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think it's getting more, more interesting now. Let's talk a little bit about Japan's economy because you write in your note that uh, when it comes to inflation, Japan is now at a crossroads. Where do you think uh, inflation goes, actually? So I personally think that Bank of Japan is underestimating the probability of higher interest rate. Um, there's a structural labor shortage that is going to happen. Um, um, and also, you know, the, the currency, I think it, the weakness is more structural. So the inflation may stay higher for longer or even uh, go up uh, higher. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think it's not clear yet. I mean, by the way, inflation is a good thing for Japan, unlike right. the U.S. or Europe. Yeah. Um, so we're waiting for inflation to, to happen. But uh, with the way things are going, real wage growth is still underwater. Yeah. So this might turn into bad inflation if there's not enough wage increases down yeah. the road. Okay, this is going to be just another stagflation. Yeah. But I'm cautiously optimistic. The companies yeah. are willing to weigh, raise more wages uh, going forward. All right, Masa, this was a great conversation. We've got to get you back soon. Masa Takeda is portfolio manager over at Spark Asset Management, a sub-advisor to the Hennessy Japan Fund. Stick with us. A lot more coming up, including our next up segment, a look at some of the startups and small businesses that could be the next big thing. This is Bloomberg. The numbers behind me don't look like much, but on a weekly basis here, third straight week of gains for U.S. financial markets defying a lot of expectations here that that rally had no legs. We're headed into a holiday shortened week next week with Thanksgiving here on Thursday and Friday, typically a low volume day here. So a lot of the gains that have been locked in this week, that might actually be it until we get back after the holiday. Nevertheless, investors will take it, encouraging economic data, encouraging earnings report and well fed speak that at least for right now didn't seem to spook anybody. That is the market story. Katie Greifeld here on this Friday afternoon, the setup into next week. Well, let's return to some of the breaking news that we've gotten in the last couple hours. And that is Sam Altman leaving OpenAI, the chief technology officer, stepping as an in as interim CEO. Uh, Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow joins us now with details. And Ed, of course, this is a quickly developing story. What right. do we know so far? Well, we don't know the reason why, but the board's said in its statement that it lost confidence in Sam Altman's ability to continue as CEO. They, they referenced his communications with the board as not being candid, as being a part of the basis that they reached that conclusion on. Uh, spoken with a few sources in the last hour, and everyone is pretty confused. I mean, as recently as this Wednesday, there was a dinner attended by Sam Altman, a number of other AI executives and high-profile names and investors. He was speaking to people there um, pretty prominently. Uh, but, in, you know, in terms of what this means, I think, you know, you guys probably covered the news. Microsoft has issued a statement saying that they remain committed to open AI and will maintain the long-term partnership. And the reason that I bring that up is that Microsoft owns 49% basically of open AI and its stock fell in the last 15 minutes of the session when yeah. this news broke. Who's running this company now, Ed? It's, it's a great question because actually for the last 10 months, what Sam Altman's been doing is flying around the world talking to policymakers and the media. 
he's a product guy, a recruiting guy, but not on the R&D side of large language models, based on my understanding. Mira Murati, who is the chief technology officer, is going to step up to being interim CEO, given Altman's departure. The other notable change is that Greg Brockman, who's a founding member of OpenAI, he was chairman of the board, so I guess part of the, the panel making this decision, he's leaving the board and becoming president uh, of OpenAI. So it's, it is a reshuffle, mm -hmm. but a lot of the deep bench of talent is still there, and they're kind of still the market leader in developing real-world AI for a consumer and enterprise customer basis. All right, Ed, we're going to have to leave it there. Ed Ludlow, our Bloomberg Technology co-host here all over, uh, one of the big stories uh, here of the day. Now, we want to transition here to our next up segment. We highlight entrepreneurs, trendsetters, basically the small businesses, the startups, and the venture capital that backs them, sort of setting up for what the next big thing is. Today, we are focusing on a company called Evernew. It looks to bring efficiencies and limit waste in the textile industry, and it has a goal for all textiles to be successfully recyclable by 2030 and creating a net neutral industry by 2050. I'm pleased to say that the CEO and founding partner, Stacey Flynn, is joining us, as well as venture capitalist Ibrahim Al Husseini, who counts Evernew as one of his investments. Now, I welcome both of you, and Stacey, please uh, be patient with us. But I do want to turn to Ibrahim first here about another topic. Uh, what Ed Ludlow was just talking about, that dinner with Sam Altman, uh, with Sam Altman uh, and some of the investors earlier this week, I'm told that you were actually a part of that dinner. We were sitting right next to them, and Peter Thiel was in that circle as well. So mm -hmm. it was surprised to hear this news after that meeting that they mentioned in the earlier segment. Was there any sort of hint here that there was a change coming at the top of OpenAI? Um, I didn't see any friction mm -hmm. around that table that I can refer to. Do you still have confidence in OpenAI, even though its co-founder isn't there anymore? I mean, it definitely has lessened a little bit. There's, this is the first uh, piece of tarnish that mm -hmm. we have now all encountered. So we'll see. All right. I do want to turn back to you, Stacey, and thanks for being patient with us. And we'll get back to the topic at hand, which, of course, is this phenomenal business that you've been piecing together here and just the whole idea of sustainability that underpins us, pins it. Uh, give us a sense here as to sort of why you went down this road. Yeah, I've been a textile and apparel specialist my entire career. And in 2010, I traveled to China. I was working for a startup out of Seattle. And I saw how we uh, achieve low price in our industry. Um, I decided that uh, this is not how uh, the story ends and decided to go back to graduate school and start studying the problem. Mm -hmm. um, in graduate school, I, I discovered two things. The first is 90% is of our clothing is made from just two fibers, polyester mm -hmm. and cotton. Then we put all of this value into our clothes and we throw away over 50 million metric tons of clothing away every year worldwide. So uh, the the bookends are the problem, the resource extraction for fiber creation right. and the waste on the back end. So uh, that's what we what we aim to take on. Yeah, I'm absolutely fascinated by, fascinated by this, uh, Ibrahim, and you're an investor in this company. And I'm just curious that when you look at sort of the solutions to uh, climate issues, uh, human waste, uh, the waste that humans create, I should say, uh, and how we solve that. I think so many people have looked to governments and even some non-governmental organizations here, but we haven't so much looked as closely to private industry to try to solve this. Which is so strange because the, you know, the, a, a low carbon economy is a technology transition just like anything else. So mm -hmm. technically everything has to be upgraded from its 20th century and 19th century polluting counterparts to their 21st century technologies that are designed from the bottom up to reconcile the carbon math to become what's called a closed loop system, just like what Evernew is doing, mm -hmm. where this idea of cradle to grave ends and it becomes a cradle to gradle system, just like nature does. Because we want to mimic nature. In nature, there's no waste. Mm -hmm. The waste of one system is the input of another system. Yeah. So that's what Evernew and other technologies that we invest in do. Mm -hmm. And that is a probably the biggest investment opportunity in human history, because like I said earlier, everything has to be upgraded. Well, Stacey, we think about waste and the waste that the fast, fa fast fashion industry creates. It's interesting uh, to see a company like Evernew uh, come through here. How does Evernew interact with that fast fashion business model? Yeah, so it's it's a big model. You know, you talk to brands and retailers about their business model being flawed, and you are faced with an automatic uh, um, uh, resistance. 
So what we've done is we've actually taken an innovative approach where we can essentially 20 to 30 percent of all garments made don't even sell. So those brands and retailers have a basically a cost center on their hands that they can leverage into an asset. Um, that's really low hanging fruit. And that's a way for us to essentially show them the power of recycling their, the products that they create. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to demonstrate that we can have stronger businesses and do it in a way that's in alignment with nature rather than working against nature. But it is a big problem because the model has so much collateral damage associated to it, with well, it. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's on your to-do list here. I see uh, that you have plans to basically create the first garment recycling facility in the U.S. that's going to take place down in South Carolina. Just walk us through uh, what the progress is there. Yeah, so we are building, we've, we've got a lease, we've got long lead time equipment on premises, we are shovel ready, we are hustling to uh, get the financing pulled together to get this thing started in January. So I am going to have a very active next six weeks to pull everything together to get going in January. I'm curious, uh, Ibrahim, how you found Stacey, how'd you find Evernew? So I've been investing in climate tech mm -hmm. since 2001. Mm -hmm. You know, I got into it because I was a scuba diver. So I have become over the last decades a well-known source for it. And that's in 2013, I started Full Cycle. So mm -hmm. Full Cycle kind of benefited from that reputation. And that's where we get to hear about fantastic technologies like Stacy's mm -hmm. ever new technology. So it's just reputational mm -hmm. and knowing that there's value alignment there. It's an authentic uh, um, path for us. It's yeah. not just because it happens to be trendy for the moment. Well, and I'm sure, as you know, though, anytime you start talking about sustainability and environmental issues, the first thing you hear from a lot of investors is, well, is this being done at the expense of potential profitability? So um, we, our fund is a market rate fund. We, everything we do is risk adjusted returns. So mm. we do not expect any concessionary returns from the work that we do and the investments that we make. Mm. With that said, one of the factors that the markets is now just starting to factor in mm. is climate change is costing us money. Mm. It is raising the premiums on insurance. Mm -hmm. It is lowering the prices of housing. It is creating health care costs. It's creating all kinds of auxiliary uh, problems that the market is going to feel the weight of. So mm -hmm. over time, investing in climate tech becomes a hedge against a teetering economy because our economy is built on a stable climate. Mm -hmm. uh, Stacey, I want to come back to you, too, uh, on this topic, and particularly when it comes to building out the business, uh, raising money. There's been a lot of discussion uh, over this year, given uh, the rise in interest rates and economic conditions, about how much harder it is for founders to, to raise new funds. Uh, against that backdrop, you also have to deal with this whole ESG backlash, uh, whether it's legit or not. That's a whole other conversation. But has that affected you in any way? Absolutely. I think every every early stage company is having a hard time raising capital right now. It feels like there's a lot of money for earlier stage companies and, and a lot of money at the growth stage. Uh, but when you're in the middle like we are, it's uh, we are we are squarely in the valley of death right now. Um, and we're not the only climate tech uh at startup in this space. So we have to get even more creative uh, with our capital raises and how we actually turn on this business. Well, Ibrahim, I'll turn that question to you. Has the backlash that we've seen, the ESG backlash in particular, I mean, the likes of Larry Fink calling ESG a weaponized term, has that impacted at all how you deploy money? Um, not, we have a very specific model that we use that we, um, pr that's proprietary to us called CROI 20, carbon return on investment in the first 20 years. Mm -hmm. Because warming begets warming. So you wanna front load the impact of the dollar's effect on climate. And that's why Evernew falls into that. Because most people don't realize we produce 100 billion pieces of clothing a year and over 60% of them end up in a landfill and break down into methane, which is 86 times more heat trapping than CO2 in the first 20 years. Wow. So when you factor all of that in, you have a very specific model yeah. that doesn't really bother itself with whether something's considered ESG or not, because it's way beyond that. And that's what we focus on. 
All right, uh, Ibrahim, this was a really uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, Ibrahim Al Husseini, uh, who runs uh, the Full Cycle Fund, a focus on climate change and sustainability, and Stacy Flynn, uh, the founder of Evernew, which is really trying to push this effort forward. Our thanks to both of them, part of our next up segment, where we do look at those startups and small businesses that are on their way to being the next big thing. Stick with us. Coming up after the break, our Wall Street Week daily segment is coming up with a closer look at what's going on in Israel and the long-term economic challenges there. That's coming up after the break on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us uh, every day here. And you've been taking a close look at the, what's been going on in the Israel-Hamas war. Yeah, exactly. And obviously the biggest story there is what's going on in the hospital and the humanitarian tolls it mounts. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible strike for all those people. But there are also economic ramifications of it. And of course, in a, in a society that really is known for its tech industry. So we talked to Dan Seenorth, author of The Genius of Israel, a book just out, actually, about not just the wars that's going on right now, but what it may be doing to the Israeli economy. This is part of what he told us. Look, there's no doubt in the near term, this is a setback. You've called up 300, the Israel's called up 360,000 people, 360,000 reserves. It's, a, it's the largest call up, I think, in its modern history. Uh, it's the, the number of Israelis that have been called up for reserves is, is larger than the standing armies of the UK and France combined. Those are people who work in the hospitality industry and the tourism industry, not that there's a lot of tourism right now, and a lot of people who work in the tech economy. So I speak to venture capitalists in Israel quite regularly, and many of them tell me that their top, the, you look, they look at their portfolio companies, about 10% of their top executives have been called up in one form or another. Does that mean these companies grind to a halt, these startups? No, but it does mean if they're in the middle of trying to close a fundraising round or in the middle of trying to complete a, a, you know, a, an M&A deal or some sort of business development or sales deal, it slows things down. That's the bad news. I think the size, the scale of the reserve call-up is going to shrink pretty soon, particularly Israel's making much more progress than I think anyone expected in Gaza. So I think they'll, they'll draw down on the reserves relatively soon. I don't know exactly when. And two... If you look at how Israel has, the economy has dealt with major security, like I go back to 1991, first Gulf War, when the whole country was shut down, when Saddam Hussein was launching Scud missiles into Israel and the whole country shut down, most of the multinationals set up in Israel that had Israel R&D centers, their Israel teams didn't miss a single deadline, didn't meet, miss a single milestone. So they've sort of proven that even when there are these security shocks, they still can hold together. I think the same will be true here in the long term. The short term, it's going to be pretty stressful. I do think the experience, so I hate to say what I'm about to say, but I do think the experience of these young people who run companies in Israel, going, having to go through this experience, developing interdisciplinary skills, having to sub in for someone who's been called up, having to juggle a bunch of balls just, be, you know, when you're, in, when you're in Gaza for three days and you come back to work for a week and you go back to Gaza for three days, I do think there's a resilience factor that ultimately serves these companies in the long run well. If they can get through the short term, I think in the long run Israel's tech economy will be stronger. Israel has had, I think, a disproportionate effect in the global economy, given its size and its location. Is that in any way in jeopardy? The integration, certainly within the Middle East, we were hoping for uh, really a rapprochement with Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That certainly is not happening anytime soon. But even more broadly in Europe and as the rest of the world starts to be really uh, uneasy with what's yeah. going on in Gaza. So I think there are two... Look, if the U.S. stays strong shoulder to shoulder with Israel during these next few months that are going to be difficult, I think the rest of the world will basically follow. I don't think... Europe is going to go in a dramatically different direction than the U.S. That's why it's very important to Israel that it stays locked arms with the United States. And so far, that's, that's pretty good. That All indicators are that's pretty strong. The question, to your point, is the Gulf and the Arab world. That's where the most progress is being made. Now, if you go back and look at why the Sunni Gulf, Bahrain, the Emiratis, the Saudis were in the works, uh, as I call Israel's friends and Israel's future friends, why all that was deepening and warming was not out of love for Israel. Those countries were doing it because they believed in Israeli strength. They were betting on the strength of Israeli, Israel's economy, its tech sectors we were just talking about, its geopolitical positioning in the world, which had been growing. 
and they believed in the, the idea that Israel's military and intelligence capabilities were a juggernaut. And they wanted a piece of it. They wanted to be part of it because they shared a co common enemy, specifically Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood. If Israel reasserts its position and perception and projection of strength, the idea that Israel has to look weak, that Israel took this hit from Hamas, they need to kind of take a step back, is the a actual wrong impulse. The right impulse is to come back swinging take out Hamas, demonstrate to the region that Israel's military and intelligence capabilities are still strong. If they demonstrate strength, I actually think these countries are still going to be on board with Israel. What Israeli decision makers should be worried about is if Israel looks weak. I think many of the Gulf states in the long run will pull back from engaging with Israel if Israel looks weak. And finally, Dan, let's come back to the origins of your book, uh, uh, The Genius of Israel. Uh, as I say, it was because of there was dissension, polarization within Israel. Obviously, that has really come together now in the face mm -hmm. of this threat from Hamas. Can you look forward to say when it's over, because it will be over at some point, what will come out of it? There are questions about Prime Minister Netanyahu and how they got into it. Uh, obviously, they have to sort that out and determine it. Is there a prospect that actually will become less divided in the future as a result of this? I, I, I look at two trends that are very encouraging. One, the Israel ultra-Orthodox Jewish Israeli, what they, we call the Haredim, the Haredi Jews, were all but, for all practical purposes, exempted from military service. The IDF has been inundated with uh, enlistment requests from these ultra-Orthodox Jews wanting to serve. That could be a positive trend and sort of can make real progress for Israel going forward. And Israeli Arabs, which represent a large minority within Israel. If you look at recent polling, their sense of identification with Israel and their sense of solidarity with their fellow citizens, including Jewish citizens, are at record high levels. And I, in that, this sense, I think the barbaric nature of Hamas's attack against Israel has left many Israeli Arabs, including their political leaders in Israel that are often very critical of Israel, saying, you know what, if it's, if it's those guys, Hamas, versus the forces of civilization here, we're with the forces of civilization. And that is very encouraging. I think you can get more Israeli Arabs feeling a part of the state and feeling some connection to the state. It's not going to happen overnight. I don't want to sound r too rosy-eyed, but there's, you're seeing real signs of progress. That was Dan Steiner. He's author of the new book, The Genius of Israel. And, Romain, it's a rather bullish take on it. Yeah. But I must say, we aren't done with this yet. We yeah, don't we know are, where it's going. We aren't done with that. I thought some of his, his responses, though, it, it's interesting perspective, yes. right? Because he gets to this idea that the sort of binary uh, the, the outcomes that I think you see in the media, that there's a lot more nuance, not only to what's going on within Israel, but also the global response. Exactly. And it'll be so yeah. fascinating to see if they can resume talks with Saudi Arabia when this thing yeah. does end in the end. And then in addition to that, we're going to have Larry Summers on talking mm -hmm. about those no CPI numbers yeah, and things. Yeah. And Larry is actually backing off a little bit of his recession call. Now he's down to 25% oh. chance. And we're also going to talk with Tony James, former president of Blackstone, about where we are with private equity. That's tonight at 6 p.m. New York time. All right, another great lineup on Wall Street Week. Stick around for that and stick around for us here on The Close. We're not done yet. We're going to set you up for what to watch next week. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>